so that you'll be able to move quickly. Uh, we'll be starting with Dr. Mumia Joffrey Osaaji. Dr. Osaaji is coming from the, he's, he's a lecturer from the Department of Literature, University of Nairobi. His interest is on personal essay. He has published widely in international journals, in, that is international refereed journals. He has also presented papers in Canada, Brazil, Caribbean, Belgium, just to name a few. Welcome, Dr. Harry. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I've already been introduced. My name is Mumia Osaji, and my paper is on remembering or forgetting the Mau Mau. Rhetorical mindscapes in Ngugi's personal essays. I make a few remarks on the title, remembering, I construe it as a double-edged term. The first bit of that term, remember, which is a verb, relates to recalling of memory, recalling of memory. The second aspect of now remembering, which is now a present participle of that verb remember, then conjures images of reconstruction, of healing, and in this particular case, of romanticization of the Mau Mau. In this paper, I have analyzed the rhetorical projection of the Mau Mau struggle in Ngugi Wathiongo's personal essays. Okay. I have analyzed the rhetorical projection of the Mau Mau struggle in Ngugi Wathiongo's personal essays. I have syncretically referenced both the postcolonial theory within the mold conceptualized by Gayatri Spivak, Homi Baba, Linda Hachion, Kwame Anthony Apia, Zandra Kambiselis, and Monashe Furusa, as well as the theory of the personal essay as conceptualized by Philip Lopate, Theodore Adorno, Holman Clarence Hugh, John Ramage, and Benson Mayers. I have engaged Googie's selective remembering and forgetting of the liberation movement. And I've also revealed palpable echoes of the unresolved and the inarticulate. I hold out the view that Ngugi's personal essays cast the Mau Mau in a rather romantic portrait. In so doing, he obscures alternative perspectives. The genre that Ngugi has used to engage with us is what we call the personal essay. The remit of the personal essay permits Ngugi the latitude to attempt self-reflexive and circumspective engagement with reality. But Ngugi appears to violate this important essayistic principle without nuance. In my view, Ngugi's essayistic rhetoric is imbued with overt confession and covert forgetting where the subjective is framed as the collective. Therefore, this paper expands the terrain of the conversations on the Mau Mau by examining Googie's personal essays as artifacts that subjectively reinterpret the collective, the pluralized memory of the Mau Mau. My analysis foregrounds three 
processes through which Gugi reinterprets the Mau Mau. These three are one, remembering and the sense of recollection of memory, remembering with an hyphen in the sense of recuperation and romanticization, and forgetting, and which I look at it in terms of silencing. My scope is limited to four personal essays. These are Bickles, in quotes, Bickles, Mau Mau and I, end of quotes. This one is found in a collection of essays known as Moving the Center. The second essay is in quotes, Mau Mau, Violence and Culture, end of quote. It is found in Homecoming. The third personal essay is in quotes, Born Again, colon, Mau Mau Untamed, end of quote. This one is found in that collection of essays called or referred to as Writers in Politics. And finally, the final essay, the fourth essay is Jem Karyuki, hyphen, a writer's tribute is also found in writers in politics. Many of my colleagues have talked about the works of Ngugi, which foreground the theme of the Mau Mau. I will not engage those ones because my focus is on the personal essay. Now, what is a personal essay? The personal essay has been conceptualized by various scholars, including Lopate, who sees it as having a personal element, a freshness of form, an intimate autobiographical style, and a projection of the subjective voice of the essayist. In literature, we call it the eye point of view. The personal essay also has an experimental and conversational tone, experimental and conversational tone. This is because the personal essay is usually conceptualized as a dialogue between the writer and the listener. In that process, the personal essay is equally marked by a sense of intimacy. A successful personal essay is one which projects the subjective intensity of the writer. Now, the personal essay is distinct from what we call the formal essay because the formal essay is characterized by a seriousness of purpose, dignity, logical organization, and considerable length in which literary technique is secondary to serious purpose. Literary technique is secondary to serious purpose. The writer of a formal essay is ordinarily a silent persona behind the words. How colonialism dismembered Kenya and therefore the justification for the Mau Mau. Gugi has drawn as to his earlier or formative experiences of the Mau Mau issues and how the Mau Mau shaped his childhood. Professor Wasampa talked about the memoir in which Ngugi captures that childhood. I will not go into those many details, but I will simply say here that Ngugi as an African writer looks at his role as a writer and he says an African writer is the sensitive tip the sensitive tip of his society, and having experienced the Mau Mau struggle as a child, Gugi feels he has the obligation to reflect on it. This is what he says about the role of the African writer. That the role of the African writer is to engage with global issues such as imperialism and to contest the worldview that subordinates the other. The African writer must reject links with the bourgeoisie and establish links with the socialist forces around the world. It's a very long quotation. I'll summarize um, it. 
So this is evidently a socialist view and it is in sync with the historical context that was prevailing at the time when Gugi was writing the essay. Now in his formative years, the British soldiers had been allocated the White Highlands, the so-called White Highlands, to the exclusion of the Mau Mau veterans who had themselves been part of the World War I and World War II in Europe, in Abyssinia, and also in Tanzania, where they had fought alongside the British. So there was the oppressive discrimination by the British in allocation of land, and this sewed or sowed the jam that brought out the Mau Mau to contest British oppression. We remember that the Mau Mau began as the Land Freedom Army. So Gugi describes in part the destruction of Africa by the British. And he looks at it in terms of dismemberment. I will quote him here very briefly, that the colonialists dismembered the colonized from indigenous memory, turning their heads upside down and burying all the memories that they had. The European planted their own memories on whatever they conducted. So with Africa dismembered, what then is the role of the writer? The role of the writer according to Ngugi is to remember. That means to recuperate, to heal, and to create reverence for that which has been dismembered. So how does he do it? In the essay, Biggles, Mau Mau, and I, from Moving the Center, Gugi reveals the complex triangular relationship between himself, at that time, a student at Alliance High School, the Mau Mau fighters, and Biggles, who was a British character in a series of stories written by Captain W.E. Jones. The interesting bit about the relationship between Gugi and that character or hero called Biggles is that Gugi was identifying with Biggles in his adventures, notwithstanding the fact that, as Gugi puts it, the same same Biggles would as well have been a pilot bombing Mau Mau warriors in the Mount Kenya forest. Because Biggles, in one of the stories, is a Royal Pilot, a Royal Air Force Pilot S. So Ngugi talks about being um, contradicted by his relationship with Biggles on the one hand, and his own brother who was in the bush fighting the British on the other. So Gugi's persona in this particular essay displays a concession structure by admitting the internal conflict within himself, the split personality, and the inability to reconcile himself with those circumstances. Now, this is the hallmark of the essay. The essay reveals the internal conflicts in a character. So Ngugi is conflicted because he finds it hard to hate Biggles in spite of the fact that Biggles is an imaginative representation of the violent imperialist oppression and domination. So in taking the reader through this innermost anguish and struggle, Gugi applies the essayistic principle of nuance which is usually critical in persuading the audience. In the personal essay, Mau Mau, Violence and Culture, Gugi enacts perhaps one of his best um, essayistic uh, style. He is reviewing a book by Fred McDunley, and that book is known as State of Emergency. 
in which the author has written about the Mau Mau in savage terms. Majdalani holds that the British settlers brought civilization to a group of primitive people, that the settlers did not steal land from indigenous communities, but rather they occupied vast tracts of land that were unoccupied. Through juxtaposition and rebuttal, Gugi adduces evidence to illustrate that the Gikuyu and other African communities had distinct indigenous land tenure systems. He contrasts the two sets of violence that reigned during the Mau Mau struggle. On the one hand, there was a wandon violence and massacre meted out by the British on freedom fighters and the people of central Kenya. And on the other hand, there was the Mau Mau violence, which was, according to Ngugi, violence that was meant to change an unjust system. This is what Ngugi says. Violence to change an intolerable and unjust social order is not savagery. It purifies man. But violence to protect and preserve an unjust oppressive social order is criminal and it diminishes man. We also see in this particular essay, a concession structure. It is true, according to Ngugi in this particular essay, that the capture of Dedan Kimathi created disorganization amongst his men. They became desperate and they tended to rely more and more on witch doctors. However, Gugi argues that the disorganized end of the Mau Mau should not be confused with its heroic beginnings and its spectacular resistance. This conception, this concession, sorry, lends this essay a balanced perspective. It allows the reader to view Ngugi as an effective, persuasive communicator. In this sense, the essay escapes the order or the stink of the polemic, which is usually associated with many of Ngugi's essays. The third essay, Born Again, Mau Mau Unchained from Writers in Politics, is also imbued with essayistic artistry. In this particular essay, Gugi reviews um, a book called or titled The Mau Mau Detainee by J.M. Karaoke. He summarizes the book in wide ranging uh, paragraphs, but I am going to tease out a few things that Gugi says about that book. Gugi makes personal reflections on the implication of J.M. Kariuki's life to Kenyans. And he pays glowing tribute to J.M. Kariuki. To clinch his argument about the role and the significance of J.M. Kariuki, Gugi holds out that for with Kariuki's death, the spirit of the Mau Mau was set free and will no longer be chained to please the imperialist interests. The last essay, Jem Kariuki, a writer's tribute, celebrates Kariuki's life after his assassination. In this particular essay, Gugi takes us through digressive linkages between local and international struggles. He asks a series of rhetorical questions. He uses the collective implicature to prick our conscience. And finally, he asks whether Kenya would be better without J.M. Kariuki. Now, in the preceding essays, this is my critique, 
Gugi has linked the Mau Mau with international struggles. And he believes that the end of the capitalist imperialist power over the other communities is nigh. Now, why do I talk about silences? I am concluding because I see my coordinator is up. Um, I can just talk off the cuff on uh, my critique of Ngugi's essays. Ngugi has silenced certain unpalatable truths about the Mau Mau. For example, on James Kariuki, he has not told us anything relating to James' wealth. James is considered to have been possibly a billionaire by that time. The fact that a billionaire would be in government, having been detained with fellow warriors who were impoverished and impecunious, should have been part of Ngugi's essays. He never mentions that bit. So it is a silence for us as critics that Ngugi ought to have put in the essay because an essay is an argument. It balances sides. Ngugi also should have been, yes, Ngugi should have paid fidelity to the personal essay as a journal. This is a journal that is nuanced. It is a journal that balances sides. It is a journal that in its thrust, it links the negative with the positive. And in so doing, in so doing, it projects a balanced suggestion or way forward. But if you look at Ngugi's essays, he has not given us a negative view of the Mau Mau. For example, the views held by John Lonsdale that the Mau Mau was purely an Indonesian struggle among the Kikuyu, or by uh, Professor Gott, who talks about um, the, the, the national frame of the Mau Mau uh, that, that should embrace all the other struggles in the country rather than the one that was happening in central Kenya. So those views have not been embraced by Ngugi. Finally, I, having said about something about the silences, I am asking myself huh, the following questions. Um, are there areas in the Mau Mau archive that must remain inarticulate silent and unresolved. Must scholars acquire us in such selective acts of silencing? That's how I end my paper. So thanks, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Geoffrey Osaji for that uh, resourceful uh, presentation. For those who are joining us a little bit later, this is our, our uh, third session. The theme is Mau Mau Pass of the Present, and I'm coordinating. My name is Wagari Dogoto from the Department of History and Archaeology. Now, at this juncture, I want to recognize a field, uh, um, a freedom fighter. Her name is Field Marshal Modoni Kirima. She is the first woman in Kenya who entered into the forest as, as a Mau Mau to fight, to fight for the freedom that you are enjoying at the present time. This was between 1952 to 1963. And it is her, Modoni Kirima, who handed over the flag. It actually it's called the Karua flag at Ruringo Stadium in Nyeri. I give her this opportunity just to, to rise up and wave to the audience. Just say hi.
dari kompak gigi. <laughs> Alright. So we are uh, we appreciate you, Field uh, Marshal Mudoni, for your coming and associating yourself with us. Guardiana Ruga Ito Yagekoyo, Nedra Quira, Moro Ediwa, we have you with Tora 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 Kendra Kida in Nagaka, Field Marshal Mudoni Kerema, Etoakua Mokera Mono, the Nova University and Nairofi. Nyo dua goka na nyo togo togo taborete dhinwa frodi witu wa Kenya todo tiga newe na tumi yage na dhuri yage to tige tuwe 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 tehida we ya dhiyo tuwe tehida kahida inega haka nyo togo shokeri ya gado na togo shokeri ya gado adora moki ma murehe feel very welcome Yes, I'll be translating. All right. She is saying hi to you. How are you? She's saying she is filled with Marshall Modoni Kirema. The independence that you are enjoying now in the Republic of Kenya. She's the one who started fighting for it. She was really searched by the, the white man. And the white man really liked her. <laughs> She was very hardworking. She would go harvesting uh, cotton uh, and other cash crops for the white man. When she stopped uh, harvesting, Pyred uh, Ramad went to, to, to study. So the white man recorded her from where she had gone to study so that she could go back and keep continue harvesting a pyrethrum for, for the white man. It was not being harvested the way the white man wanted it done. She has really worked for the white man. So she stopped working for the white man and, uh, and, and went to fight for the independence of this republic. She stayed in the forest for more than 22 years, day and night. So when it comes to fighting for independence and fighting for this country, so she had done it uh, whether dying or, or, or being alive. It was a matter of life and death, that is. There were many. Some perished in the process. Others surrendered. But she came out. She came out with the, 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 the flag. It's called, in Kikuyu, they call it uh, the flag of Karua. That's where she met uh, uh, the late uh, first president of the Republic of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, at the Rolingo Stadium in Nyeri. So she gave the, the flag to the first play, to the first late president, uh, Jomo Kenyatta, the flag made out of uh, made, made out of leather made out of leather that's why it's called bedera ya karua she have worked for this country 
She's saying that a people's country is, is very important. So she's saying that this is God's power because God is om omnipresent, has all the power. So she thanks God who is the creator of heaven and earth. Because people are many. Others are dead. Others died. But she was able to come out victoriously calling the flag of the Republic of Kenya that we're enjoying now. Freedom is very important. I tell you, people, freedom is very important. So, so that we, they, we were able to, 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 to come from the control of the white man. So we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, a freedom firefighter. Let's take this opportunity to welcome, uh, to, to, to thank and appreciate uh, uh, Mudoni Kerima. Thanks so much, thanks so much, and we appreciate you. All right, she can say she can take a whole year to talk about this country. Okay. So, I, hmm? so I also take this opportunity to appreciate and, 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 uh, and welcome to this conference, we have the former PC of Nairobi. His name is Asante Nsana. Asante Nsana for coming. So we want to recognize the presence of Mr. Joroge Dirago, the former PC Nairobi. Here he is. Feel very welcome, Mr. Joroge, for taking time and seeing the essence of coming to join us in this Mau Mau conference. Feel very welcome. And welcome again when we have another conference. Now, after uh, uh, Dr. O o Osaji presentation, we have a discussant because our discussant, her name is Dr. Miriam Maranga Musonye. Dr. Miriam Baraga Musonye is the head of department literature in the University of Nairobi. And since she is, she's having some commitment, we have asked her to, 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 to discuss Dr. Uh, Os, uh, Osaji's work. Welcome, Dr. Thank you. I have only five minutes yeah. starting now. I, I think I won't even take five. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Godwin Siundu, my colleague in the department is actually the one who's supposed to do this job. But now I have also been thrown under the bus. I think it's the tradition, like it was done to Alex this morning. So I am standing here as Dr. Siundu. Uh, Osaji, Thank you so much for your very interesting presentation. In the morning, we talked about uh, Googie's fiction and also his uh, autobiographical works, but now you have taken us to the essay, his uh, personal essays. And um, some of the points that are interesting, which you brought out are um, the aspect of uh, memory, and memory is very important in Gogi's works, uh, whether fiction or whatever, but particularly in his uh, actuality works like the autobiographical works and the personal essays, because we realize that of course, all writers do write from experience, but uh, in, the, in the case of Gogi Wathiongo, we see a lot of um, his writing being very significantly steeped in his own experience and therefore there is a lot of reference to memory. And uh, the interesting bit about your title, which has th that double-sided uh, aspect 
of memory, which has to do with recollection of the experience and also drawing from consciousness and also remembering. Now, this is important, especially looking at it from the perspective of Ngogi Wathiongo, because of his uh, stated um, standpoint that uh, the colonial experience dismembered Africa. And when we think about dismembering, we can think about it in various levels. Uh, the first level that is quite obvious is dismembering in a geographical sense. This is the creation of the colonial boundaries, which uh, we live under today and which continue sometimes to be uh, a blessing and other times to be a curse. And there are several writers who have engaged with this uh, dismembering. One of them um, is uh, Aikwe Yama, the Ghanaian writer, who talks about fragmentation of Africa. So there was a geographical fragmentation, which Gogi talks about and other writers have talked about. But apart from the geographic um, uh, dismembering, there is also the mental and the psychological. And this is the disconnection of Africans from their past and from their identity or the connection with their identity. It's a kind of dismembering. So when uh, our colleague Osaji talks about remembering and remembering, it becomes significant because it's something that I think that um, you know, we can relate to. Uh, of course, Osaji makes the argument that Ngogi romanticizes Mau Mau. Now, I think that uh, for us as critics, as historians, as literary scholars, or whatever else, or whichever other hat we wear, <clears throat> that's quite interesting to think about. But what I would challenge us to think is, you know, every writer, every scholar, every critic comes into a situation with a position. Because I don't think that it is possible for anybody to be neutral about anything. So, uh, and that uh, romanticizing, Perhaps if uh, we, know, we could call it that, and there could be that argument, it could be also a position taken in the context of what has the history been? What has, what has the archive of Mau Mau, whatever information is available, what has it presented to us? And therefore, which is the other perspective that uh, a writer like Ngugi can present to us? And uh, because, Osaji was talking about the personal essay. I think we need to also be aware of the fact, and he did it so well, gave us you know, a very clear perspective of what the personal essay is like. Uh, but one of the things I think myself about the personal essay is that uh, it humanizes and familiarizes the writer. Because critical essays sometimes, uh, they are too academic, they distant the writer. But the personal essay brings the writer into familiar relationship with, with, the, with the audience. And I think that's where now anecdotes, um, personal experiences that the writer can bring into a situation become significant. And in the process, the idea of um, romanticizing something may actually be kind of come to the fore. But this is what I would say as my conclusion, that I think in the personal essay, the writer is saying, without saying it directly, that this is the truth as I see it. This is my truth. And this is my interpretation of this situation. Or in our case, this is my interpretation of the Mau Mau as I see it and as uh, I have reflected on it. Thank you very much. Uh, let me hand over the mic. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Miriam Msonye, for your observation on matters arising uh, on uh, Dr. Mumia Osaji's work. At this juncture, I want to call 
we, we, we have time for, for questions after we do the presentations. This is the way we do it. So we want to go to, the, to our second presenter. Our presenter, our second presenter is Dr. Margaret Gashehe. Dr. Margaret Gashehe is a lecturer in the Department of History and Archaeology in the University of Nairobi. She has extensively published in the areas of Mau Mau history. Her MA work was on women at Mau Mau. Her doctor of philosophy work was faith and nationalism. Mau Mau and Christianity in Kikuyulad during the colonial period. Welcome, Dr. Ari. Glad Field Marshal Mudoni was with us uh, this afternoon. Sometimes we need to see the living history of those who we are talking about. My paper is a compressed paper. So I would like to begin with buyer beware because uh, uh, when you compress an academic paper, sometimes you wonder if your arguments uh, come through but that is in the interest of time, only 20 minutes, you can only see so much. Now, as we reflect on the declaration of a state of emergency, I would like to offer a brief reflection on what should ideally be about Mau Mau detainees, but in fact, it's not about detainees, it's about a three-pronged contestation in colonial Kenya between the colonial administrators, between the missionary church, and between an outfit called the Moro Rearmament, um, MRA. And therefore my, my paper is titled, Whose Morality? Whose Morality? Moro Rearmament, and rehabilitation of Mau Mau detainees in the 1950s. So it could be a bit misleading because it ropes in the detainees, but actually uh, everyone is shouting over their head. Uh, it's not about the detainees at all. And I guess that is the point of my presentation. Let me just mention something about the methodology because this paper relies almost wholly on archival documents of the church, the church archives, so to speak. A little bit of that also in the Kenya National Archives. Most of all these documents are marked as confidential. They are copies of copies. And as a researcher that tells you something, it's about the very furtive, secretive nature of the correspondence between the groups that I'm going to speak about this afternoon, those three uh, groups. And I know it's important for a researcher to triangulate their sources, but this was an experiment. It was only six months. And therefore, there is a reason why I thought you could present an academic uh, paper that relies mainly on one set of resources. And let me state my conclusion at the outset. Now, this paper, which looks at the failed experiment, so it was a failed experiment of the moral rearmament intervention at the behest of the colonial administration for the Mau Mau detainees rehabilitation at a camp called Adi River Detention Camp. So like a case study, it speaks to really just this a particular detention camp. 
And my conclusion, as the government of Kenya did then, the administration, was that this experiment was disastrous. It was disastrous. And my paper, we examine why this didn't work and the import of the MRA being roped into Kenya in the rehabilitation of detainees. Let me say that MRA found a niche in colonial politics when sections of the administration, not all of them, but just sections of the administration allowed MRA to use its methods in this particular uh, camp. And uh, through the results that would come out of the camp, they hoped that they could replicate this across other detention camps uh, in the colony. Now, the question is, why the moral rearmament? Why are we talking about MRA in Kenya? Why is, it, why is this narrative important? I think this is because it falls into the broader orbit, if you want, conceptualization of the interface, the confluence between church, faith, Christian faith, and the colonial state. It is part of the larger narrative of the Bible and the flag, so to speak. It is a cohabitation between Christian faith and temporal rule. And I dare say that uh, for our people who are incarcerated, for our people who are hardcore detainees, uh, they are being required to renounce all that they stood for by the church, by MRA, raises many questions. And again, that is where the problem of my paper lies. How do you use faith, spiritual intervention, if you want, which we know in colonial Kenya was a coercive tool of domination? Question. Let me give a very brief background because of time. Now, MRA, the moral rearmament around 1938, had its roots in the 20th century American evangelical Protestantism. It was the brainchild of one Frank Bachman, who spoke about, or let me say that uh, the outfit really then in the late 19th, 1930s uh, was speaking to the buildup of the military rearming that was going on in Europe at the time, just before the Second World War uh, broke out. And its founders, Bachman and others, believed that military rearming uh, um, re alone would not solve the crisis in Europe, and neither would it solve the crisis in other hotspots in the world, Kenya included. Their argument was that the crisis building up in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, was fundamentally a moral one. It was not about military buildup, that it was a moral crisis. And therefore, they argued this required a moral intervention, and therefore moral rearmament. The story is long, and we do not have the time for it. But I think it's important to mention the anti-communist nature of MRA, because this had implications for an African continent that was moving towards independence. And that communist angle was going to play out in the politics of MRA, the church in Kenya, and the political detainees. MRA was accused of being cultist in certain sections, that it was a cult, that the way it proselytized was in a manner that uh, behoved more of a cult than a Christian outfit. In fact, the founder, Bachman, 
was openly anti-communist. There's no question about that. He was well known for that. And therefore, it explains, this explains why MRA in Africa targeted for conversion what they called white fascists, what they deal, uh, deemed as African national leaders. It targeted the trade unionists whom they were calling to what MRA referred to as a higher ideology that in Africa they wanted to create new men with a new character, whatever that represented. So I dare say that those virtues that MRA represented or purposed was what was going to be used for the re uh, rehabilitation of detainees in the Athi River detention camp. And I dare say again, that these were virtues that were hardly recognizable to detainees. We all know about the Happy Valley and the example that the settlers had set in Kenya. And here was MRA and here was the church talking about higher ideals, talking about the new man and the new character. Uh, you can make your own conclusion. Now, what is the inter intersection with rehabilitation and MRA? Now, I think it is safe to state that by the middle of the 1950s, the military war in Kenya had virtually come to an end, what we call the shooting war. It had ended. And Kenya was entering what the administration called the reconstructive phase. This reconstruction was three-pronged. It had three, it was a tripod, three-pronged. The first one was villagization. And villagization was going to be the linchpin, the linchpin that was going to counter civilian support for the Mau Mau. The other one was land consolidation or adjudication, if you want. And in my view, this was double-edged. It was a double-edged sword. Because in Kikuyu land, it was very popular that pieces of land would be put together. Kikuyus are enterprising, so they looked forward to that to, for individual enterprise, so to speak. Land consolidation was also meant to pull the rug, so to speak, under the Mau Mau a group that is talking about land all the time. And here is the colonial government taking initiative to begin to do something about the land. So when we uh, evaluate the successes of the Mau Mau, uh, it's not just whether the military war was lost. I think there's much more to it as to what it goaded the colonial government to begin doing at the time. Now the third prong was centered on rehabilitation of Mau Mau detainees. And Mau Mau detainees were a huge conundrum in Kenya. It was a huge problem for the colonial administration and everybody realized that. There was a lot of concern, not just in Kenya, but in the British parliament, questions were raised and there was a, lo a lot of furor, if you want, because of its very cruel, illegal, dehumanizing manner in which it was carried out. We all know that there was no legal just justification in, uh, uh, in it, and that the officers involved, including the African officers involved, had become law unto themselves. So this is how the church and the MRA was roped in by the administration to experiment on creating this new man, to use the spiritual force to transform society through conversion, through confession, through surrender, and through sharing. It is a big order very big order 
for a colonized and even a bigger order for the detained. So what was the role of the church and the MRA? It was simply to soften the detainees, to break them down, the hardened detainees. It was to turn them malleable, if you want, and goad them towards confession from their evil way, evil ways. Indeed, all those were the cynic who were known for detainees release. You could not be released unless you confessed, until you surrendered, until you broke down. And who was better to do that than the church, than faith, the Christian faith, than MRA? Now, because of time, let me go straight into why MRA intervention failed, that experiment failed. It only lasted six months. So I'm not too sorry that I was not able to talk to the detainees because it really never took off in the first place. It's more of a cautionary tale about how the colonial government, even up to the very tail end of their rule, handled those that they colonized over. I propose three th reasons. There could be more. The first one was the propagandist nature of the MRA and the churches in this endeavor. The colonial government itself proposed that MRA should prepare a syllabus, syllabus where new ideas would be hammered into the detainees. And the core of this was to instill fear it was fear mongering when you think about it. Because the idea was that they would bombard these detainees with incessant repetition that they had been abandoned by their own people, that they had been fooled, that they were lost, they were forgotten, and that their families despised them. That was the church. That was the MRA. Five. Now, this fear-mongering approach to hardened de detainees, of course, hardly yielded any result. And soon enough, that experiment was deemed a complete waste of time and money. The second reason was the clash between the Christian Council of Kenya, as well as the church action group that was chaired by one Reverend David Steele. So what happened is that this degenerated into a shouting match as to who had the more moral authority over the detainees. What is it that they should be taught before they were drained back into society, reintegrated into society? And MRA was convinced that its new approach, its superior ideology, uh, informed by living absolute standards, absolute honesty, purity, and selfish love was just the thing to rehabilitate hardcore detainees. The third one was uh, the attitude of the local church in Kenya. And I will take just one representative, Bishop Beecher, who, for example, dismissed MRA as a humanist and not necessarily a Christian outfit. Right? He argued that MRA was attempting to substitute a human philosophy for what he called our most sacred faith. Now, Dr. Max Warren, very close to Beecher, was not entirely dismissive of MRA. He ventured that it had potential, but its potential lay not in Kenya, but in Europe. And even then, in the context of the disillusionment of Europe in the day. The third one uh, is that in my view, MRA was obsessed with communism and communism in Kenya. Instead of confronting the physical and spiritual needs of the detainees, 
MRA went on to completely, on a completely different target, creating a bogeyman of communist infiltration in Kenya. And therefore, of course, in the end, its uh, endeavor had very limited uh, success. Those uh, accusations or allegations were unsubstanti unsubstantiated. I don't think to date there has been any a very good study that the Mau Mau had links to communism. In conclusion, therefore, Tabitha, the experiment failed and it triggered a blame game, blame game in Kenya. MRA talked about the hurdles set in its way. It talked about connivance. It talked about treachery and so on and so forth. But it raised important questions, right? That not least of which was that the tools and mechanisms of resolving the Mau Mau problem in Kenya had to be homegrown. That became quite clear, as opposed to ideas superimposed from outside. And secondly, that although MRA was rejected by the church, it gave some impetus, in my view, into the journey towards a more indigenized African church in Kenya. And this they had to do by reviewing the relation of the gospel to the nationalist undertaking in colonial Kenya. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we take this opportunity to appreciate Dr. Margaret Kashehe for such an insightful presentation. And uh, I'll be calling the discussant for this work because uh, he is also has a, an assignment to deal with after this. His name is Dr. Pius Kakai. Dr. Pa Pius Kakai is coming from Kenyatta University in the Department of History, Archaeology, and Political Science. Welcome, Dr. Kakai. I have forgotten to mention that Dr. Kakai is a senior lecturer. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of History and Archaeology in Kenyatta University. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Professor, for presenting this very powerful debate about the moral rearmament and the uh, but it was so philosophical, and then I think you chose not to conclude. Because you said you concluded, and you did not tell us whose morality. And I think that's why five minutes would not have been good. Um, I like the way she gave the background, and of course told us about the methodology, ideally the Kenya National Archives. Um, and therefore, it was fitting that we had a great lady uh, Muthoni to come and give us the other angle, isn't it? That after all, what they were doing, that experiment of Arthur River, uh, did not bear fruit because you saw the lady was saying she was uh, not apologetic, uh, meaning the moral rearmament was the moral aspect from the West. Uh, and even from the West, not from the East, isn't it? Um, but I thought, as you debated, while it never succeeded in breaking the bones of the serious nationalists, uh, going by the confession of the lady, some actually broke and surrendered, isn't it? Uh, and I, now the one great person who may have been convinced is the leader, the post-colonial leader. Maybe that's where you, you draw the, the, the conclusion. Because until the son of Nyeri came to the throne and legalized Mau Mau, Jomo never legalized Mau Mau, right? Daniel Torijic, Arab Moy never, and so that morality of the MRA may have taken the long tangent and convinced the leadership. Um, and I think that's the debate where it goes, um, that while they did not understand 
the genesis of my mind. I agree with you because they also began from a philosophy, isn't it? That philosophy that went with Othing also. And that Othing also gave them the variety of the values that Gikuyu believed in. And that's why you have brought about the issues of land. And I think that's why even the little guy talked about um, the land freedom army. So I suspect that when you eventually get time, you will actually bring into the post-colony so that we mention people who seem to have thought this was bad, because after all, even Jomo denied it uh, when he was in Kapenguria. Though Dawson thought that he was betraying him, the guilt came and he confessed in his book, right? So in my thinking, I like the debate. You have begun it, and I think it should percolate. It should continue so that uh, in this debate of the moral rearmament, because it was external, uh, we are saying, like you have concluded, that we need the homegrown solutions. And perhaps that's why, eventually, that fear of Mao Mao contributed, like the lady has said, to our being free today to deliberate on it. And Madam Chair, I am not going to eat into you, your time. Thank you very much. So, uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Kakai, for that observation. Now, we are, we are coming back now to our third presenter. Her name is Faith Alube. Faith is a Chief Executive Officer, Kenya Lad Alliance. So she will be having her, her presentation. She will be making a presentation. And in the meantime, Mr. Masika, you'll be the discussant of this work, but after she, she does her presentation. Uh, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much. My introduction is that simple. I'm a land justice activist for the last 18 years. I'm a human rights lawyer that focuses on transitional justice. And yes, I work at the Kenya Land Alliance. Kenya Land Alliance is a non-governmental organization that advances land justice. We are based in Nakuru and um, we are a membership organization. So I'm also on a membership drive here. But today I'm here to talk about the unanswered questions of the liberation struggle. I'm talking about this from a background of transitional justice. I've been able or I've been privileged to work on four cases. I'm the officer that worked on the Mau Mau reparation case after the award at the Royal Court of Justice in London while I was working at the Kenya Human Rights Commission. I'm also the officer who worked uh, with the communities around Kakuzi and Del Monte to support those communities to access justice in Kakuzi 1, the first case, Kakuzi 2, the second case. And right now I'm working with communities in Kericho uh, to confront Unilever. So I'm going to talk from that background. There are some unanswered questions as a practitioner. For the last 18 years, they normally frustrate me. And it's great to see my senior, Zarina, always a pleasure. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, my brother, for inviting me, Dr. Yombongi. So I appreciate this space. So my presentation will be mainly from a practitioner's point of view. The people who carry the placards, they look like me. Let, let not the court lie to you. So the first one is the narrative itself. There's always this narrative that, you know, uh, the liberation struggle, and I'm talking about the liberation struggle. I know this about Mau Mau, but I'm going to expand it. The liberation struggle has always been situated in central province. And that's what I thought for a very long time until it reached a point where we were supposed to disperse the, we're supposed to execute the out of court settlement from the Royal Court of England, land in London. And um, we had 5,228 claimants uh, from all over Kenya. We even had claimants from um, Kisumu, Maget Islands. We had claimants from Lamu, Manda Islands. We had claimants uh, from my rural village in Maseno. Uh, 
So that narrative, that um, that narrative, that the liberation struggle only took place in central Kenya, it is not true. But it is an unanswered question. It's a lingering question because I don't know. It's because we've never focused on these other parts of the country to bring out their story. We have. Um, liberation movements as far as to Rukana, people who confronted the recommendations of the Maurice Carter report in 1932 and 1957. And such stories, you never hear about them. It's an unanswered, it's a lingering question that um, as activists, we are trying to bring it out, but it will be interesting to also hear what the academics have to say. If you look at the narrative, what we also discovered during the the Mau Mau case is that the factionalism within the Mau Mau even affected the way they related to each other. I remember when we started, uh, when we started pushing now for the actual case in 2009, we had 55,000 claimants and we met at Strathmore University. I'll be mentioning names as long as I can defend myself in any space. So I will mention names because this is a practitioner's point of view, right? So we met 55,000 practitioner, sorry, 55,000 veterans at Strathmore University to try and have one case so that in the long run, we do not have factions, factions from Nyeri, Machakos, wherever. And we could not agree. It's good that I, I saw <laughs> Field Marshall here. I should have rem reminded her that conversation. Out of the 55,000, we only remained with 5,528 simply because um, factionalism within the Mau Mau. I remember when we came back from the UK, uh, there are some claimants that even refused those tokens because the out of court award from the UK had three parts. The first part talked about a statement of apology from the then prime minister, William Higg. And then the second part had tokens for 5,228 veterans, including, um, the four main litigants, the test, the test suits, they were getting around two million each. We came back with two billion pounds. And the third part of that state of that um, award um, is the construction of a memorial at Uru Park. That memorial is there, and we tried to put that story. But even with that memorial between us. The steering committee that was leading the execution of that award, we were like six or seven organizations. Back then, I was working at the Kenya Human Rights Commission. We had the National Museums. We had the British High Commission representing the Foreign Commonwealth Office. And we had our program manager, Davinda. And between us, with all the English we know, it took us two years to, to be able to draft 400 words to put in the plaque two good years, because one of us could not want some words to appear in those plaques, words like mukombozi, words like heroes, words like mau mau. I'll leave you to guess who didn't want such words. They just wanted words like reconciliation, you know? And, and it took us two years to draft those words, 400 words. There are four plaques. If you go to that memorial, you'll find those, that, that, that piece of history. It's a lingering question because we, we, I normally ask myself almost 60 years after independence and we cannot have honest conversations about our liberation struggle. It is a fact that some of us died and paid the ultimate price for that struggle. We should not be shy to mention some needs. Uh, the issue of intergenerational conversations, even among us, the Mau Mau fraternity themselves, is also something that lingers. It needs to be handled better. Um, there are communities, especially around Nyeri, that were displaced and their lands were taken away. Some of them still live by the roadside. And now there are generations after that, after the initial first generation that fought for land and freedom. It is also an issue to be argued if we are liberated and if we have land. Do we have liberty? Do we have land that these people paid the ultimate price for? It is arguable among us, the fraternity. But for us as practitioners, we normally wonder, a lingering question is the generations of people who never went to school, who were never lived, never lived a privileged life because their parents were fighting 
for land and, and, and freedom? Those are some of the lingering questions and when you talk to them, they are very bitter. The second issue um, that I've touched uh, a little bit is the intergenerational conversations. Why, why do I keep on repeating this? There's, um, there's a generation of children of the Mau Mau that are not very clear what they should be doing post the active participation of their parents in the struggle. And this affects even the way they relate to each other, the way they relate to people who are not Mau Mau, who are not deemed as uh, Mau Mau back then, they were deemed as Omgads, and I'm going to touch that. Um, that is something that should be handled better. It is a lingering question from the liberation struggle that I feel needs more attention. The third one is the land question. As we speak, the land policies are still affected by colonial legacies. And I'll give an example. Back in 1920, we had um, laws like the land annexing law of 1920, it was reviewed in 1925 and 1927. This is the law that gave land to multinationals like Unilever, back then it was called Brookside. This is the law that gave land to multinationals like Kakuzi Fiber, back then it was Kakuzi Fiber, right now it's Kakuzi Limited. And, 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 and this multinational still operate to date. People, communities were displaced back then. Who's talking about those displaced communities right now? As we speak, I mentioned about Kakuzi 1 and Kakuzi 2. In Kakuzi 1, we tried to bring attention to the uh, fate of the 16 communities that were displaced in 1922 by the award of land, 44,000 acres in Thika to Kakuzi Fiber. Kakuzi Fiber uh, list part of that land to Del Monte and Rea Vipingo. So um, when we tried to bring attention to that, um, the fate of those communities, they were displaced and they, 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 if you look at where they're living, they're not even habitable. Some of them still live in the 10 by 10 huts that they are, uh, can I say their ancestors? Because <laughs> that there's a generation of, of people who are working there coming from Nyanza because you get their places called Nyanza names. So the 10 by 10 huts that these people live in, you cannot even repair that hut unless you get permission from Kakuzi Limited. If it starts leaking, you'll write to the company to give you permission to repair that hut in 2022. And there are areas of that Kakuzi farm from 1920 to date um, that you need a 44, a 48 hour notice for you to be able to pass the gate passes. So they also closed public access uh, for communities that they displaced. This is 2022. So you start asking yourself, when will these people feel the, the freedom that their ancestors fought for? And most of them, if you look at them, most of them will tell you, um, they were uh, shipped from wherever they were shipped from to come work in the plantations and most of their relatives went into the bush. So that's a lingering question that we need to ask. Our land laws are still affected by that. If you look at the regimes that we have now, the community land, back then it was customary tenure, same rules. If you look at the private land, back then it was private land. If you look at the government land, right now it's being called public land according to chapter five of our constitution. So there's still that effect. People who live in places like Turkana, people who live in the Asal areas where there are trust lands, they cannot even register their lands. That trust lands was a trust land act of 1940. It became, it was repealed in 2016. So you see, there are still lingering questions around there. And it's so serious to a point where if you go to areas like Torukana and Marsabit and Mostasal areas, which were trust lands back then, and they were made to be like that by the Maurice Carter Commission report, which is a very interesting report. There are two reports, 1932 and 1957. They are very interesting, they are online. You'd, you'd, be, you'd understand why some part of our country is still the way it is. Number four, I guess, the, generation, the, the, the generational exclusion of women 
from development, real development. It still happens to date. That's also a lingering question. If you look at these women who are in this struggle and you ask them, okay, so what was the role of women back then? It's good we've seen Field Marshall, but she's in the exception. And even if you ask her for details, she'll not give you details. I remember one of the discussions we had and we normally have that lingers is the abuse that female veterans went through. No one talks about that. I have met a female veteran who has 12 children from 12 different men and different races. All of them as a result of the liberation. And she'll not talk about it. She'll tell you we went to war and we won. And you ask her, you won with 12 children that you don't know the fathers? That is a very, each day she wakes up, she's reminded of those stories. She will tell you the story, but she'll not tell you how she got those 12 kids. You know, those are lingering questions that we need to start talking about. The abuse between the, I don't want to call them combatants, the abuse between the freedom fighters themselves. That is something that we need to talk about. And they rarely do. I wish I could have asked her, she was here. I asked her so many times and she does not respond. And then um, the next question, um, has to do with restitution. When we go to these international um, spaces for justice and then an award is given or it's, does that restitute? Can someone say that a woman whose uterus was pulled out by the roadside in 1960 will be restituted with 2 million shillings? Is that enough? Can someone say that, you know, um, people who live with bullets and they are still there the veterans are still there who live with bullets in their bodies um the recompense of forty thousand, the token of forty thousand three hundred and forty thousand, was enough uh to make them happy is that something that someone can say um, is enough restitution or any form of reparation for that matter and if you look at the at the colonial administration uh, one of the things that, um, one, there are three things that kept coming back when we were, um, when we instituted that case in 2009 and we got an award in 2013, three things. Number one was the issue of jurisdiction. Is it in our jurisdiction that the colonial administration back between 1895 and 1963, is it in their jurisdiction that they should be held liable for it? That is one of the questions. The other question was the issue of liability. They were talking about the lapsing of time. I mean, 60 years later, you cannot bring this case to us again. And the third aspect had to do with the human rights angle of the whole torture and ill treatment that the veterans went through. And there were questions around these three issues. And I remember it was a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And we even kept saying, um, you cannot talk about liability, jurisdiction, and time lapsing because we know it was a government policy to institute as much torture and ill treatment on those veterans as much as could be done. And that's why they, they, they opted for an out of court settlement. But the restitution that came out of that process, does it suffice? That's a lingering question that uh, we still have to talk about. And then uh, the previous speaker spoke about the at the river detention center. I'd just like to, to touch about it a little bit. The at the river detention center, before I start on the at the river, there are 24 mass grave sites that, um, that no one speaks about. I know people who live around those, those communities that had Mau Mau uh, know what I'm talking about. The 24 uh, did, uh, mass grave sites, those, that 24 number was given to us by the Mau Mau Veterans Association. And the Athi River Detention Center, the head of the Athi River Detention Center was a very cruel man called Norman Luvaye. Norman Luvaye was living between the Chumbi Hill and Small World. I know we know Small World. So the Chumbi Hill was his backyard. And Norman Luvaye set up a torture camp in Lukenya, Lukenya uh, just opposite Chumbi Hill. 
That land that that uh, torture camp used to be was bought by Guy Muli, Muli Guy Muli, the first CJ, black CJ. Yes, if you go to that land, you'll still get traces of that torture, torture, torture camp. And it's quite unfortunate because the people who were tortured there and died there used to be buried on Chumbi Hill. Chumbi Hill was bought by the Catholic Church in 19, um, just after independence. And the Catholic Church marked 12 mass graves on Chumbi Hill. These are things you can go confirm right now. And those 12 graves, mass graves on Chumbi Hill, no one talks about them. So we tried to push for excavation and we tried to push for memorialization around that site and it became complicated. Get a court order. Are we going to argue that case in court that we want to do what? So the Catholic Church gave us one acre of land as activists to put up a memorial, but with a court order. So we have the land there, the land is there for the memorial, but we do not have mechanisms to do that. The other mass grave that I also visited is um, the Gyo, right here. The 1,000 people who were buried alive. In that site, you don't need a tool. You just use your hands and you come out with human bones. Who's, who's addressing those questions of the mass graves? That's a lingering question. Sorry if I've made you feel somehow. Sorry. <laughs> uh, then the next one is documentation of the liberation struggle. After we came back from the, after we came back with the settlement, all of a sudden we could not access some documentation at the National Archives. All of a sudden, this documentation was put in a strong room. All of a sudden, uh, we could not even quote some of the documents we had already even seen, like documents around the detention centers, documents um, of the first parliamentary proceedings that even were detailing what was happening. We could not access it anymore. Um, and we kept wondering, I thought this is public information and it should be kept as, as such. But if you go there, you cannot be able to access the documents. Some of the documents that we used in UK to support the case, we were given by former colonial administrators, the ones that were sympathizers. And um, in conclusion, just a minute. So some of the documents we used were, we were given by former colonial administrators. And um, there's an interesting um, discovery called the High Slope Discovery that is also online. It really supported the case. So when it came to execution, uh, we could not access some of that documentation. Another question, lingering question, is the cyclic nature of abuse. In 1920, we had the Unilevers, the Finleys, the Brookbonds. In 2022, we have the TNCs, the NRTs, you know, doing the same, same business that uh, these other ones were doing in 1922 in the name of conservancies. We should ask ourselves, is that the way we want to go? Because those are land grabs. I told you, I'm going to call it like it is because that's what it is. It is a land grab. Then there's the Dedan Kimathi story. I remember uh, we went to Kamiti prison together with Dedan Kimathi's daughter to go and look for the grave, her father's grave. And we found stones which are there. If you are privileged to go to Kamiti prison, you should pay a visit. The stones are written the number of, for instance, if a stone is on that spot, the number of um, uh, prisoners, who have been buried under the stone, like for instance, 1900 to 2000, because they are mass graves. That stone bears that number. If it is 500 people, the stone bears that number, like for instance, from one to 500, you get? So we went there and this um, guy who, when the body was brought, because the body was brought to committee, um, he had been killed elsewhere. So this old man is trying to locate that position he had two leg cushions, but no one knows where that guy was buried. And, 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 and that shuja deserves more. 
it deserves more. It took us three whole days to go through those mass graves at committee, and they're there. If you go there, I hope they let you in. You'll see those mass graves, a whole field of mass graves. Those are among us the lingering questions we should be asking ourselves 60 years down the lane. We cannot answer some of these questions. The idea of um, the million acre funds to buy land. It damaged our land history the more than we accept because we have companies like the Embakasi Ranching Company, Mboi Kamiti. You've heard about them, or I'm talking Greek, Katelembu. All those are land buying companies that the Soilo Ranch, all those are land buying companies that were mooted with our first, by our first president after he was given the million acre funds as a result of the Maurice Carter report. Um, where, where, where is that money and where are those lands and why are we being affected by land buying companies that keep on popping up each time you want to buy land or each time you touch a cadaster? We should ask ourselves those questions. Why do we touch a cadaster and these ones, this, you know, these cartels pop up? Those are facts of the matter 60 years later. And then the last one. From the Maurice Carter report, we have leaseholds. When I say leaseholds, you understand? The leaseholds that some of these companies hold, they are not public information. Yet, yet, these leaseholds occupy huge tracts of land. Who's going to ask that question for answers? As I conclude, I'd say 60 years, almost 60 years after independent, it's, 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 it's a high time. We call it by its name not a big spoon, it's called a spade. We just call it a spade and address the questions. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Faith, for such a resourceful presentation. And we must appreciate your organization for fighting for the rights of the Mau Mau in terms of their land. We have our fourth presenter. Uh, his name is Professor Katumanga Musabai. Professor Katumanga Musabai is coming from the Department of Political Science and Public Administration from the University of Nairobi. Uh, uh, to present this paper, here he comes. So let's appreciate uh, Professor, Professor Katumanga. Understanding the fact to justify my inability to live up to the expectations, given what you've had. And I hope you'll bear with me with respect to the, to the same. Anything that happens in that kind of circumstance, you should blame the organizers, as we shall say. Pardon? <laughs> okay. Um, so I thought 
I might be able to share with you some reflections. I initially called them notes, basically on what I prepared to refer to as Mao Mao's argument, the long durée war, and the roots of okay, and the roots of uh, termite activities or termite movements in the Republic of, uh, of Kenya. I want to believe my old friend uh, George Gona gave you uh, some presentation yesterday on some of or the type of movements of that kind. But this time around, let's call them the intellectual wing of those kind of groups. But for us to be able to put them into context and the argument we're trying to uh, advance over here, I thought with the permission of the historians, we always refer to historians as the, our, our brothers who facilitate archival materials and we in the political science do the analysis. So I might say a few things over here which they're not gonna be <laughs> impressed about it, all right? I will try as much as possible to appreciate them by trying to contextualize them with respect to what we call geopolitics. And here we're picking out an aspect of what you call historical geography, all right? And so the basic assumption here is to try and understand geography in its duality, in terms of its human and uh, physical component and the impact it has with respect to the whole question of uh, culture, the whole aspects of politics, societies, if you wish. So you may want to run records to Thucydides and what we call the, what he called the Peloponnesian War, the role of geography in trying to understand uh, the orientations of both Spartans and uh, the Athenians with respect to their geographical dynamics. You may also want to have an appreciation here in terms of the tendencies in this case from my uh, historical uh, geographers to move away from the fixation of events, right? And more specifically, the tendency to be more concerned about the structures and the outcomes of those structures. But now to focus ourselves in this case on why certain issues remain a recurrence, that tendency of recurrence, other aspects like, for instance, what our former, our immediate uh, speaker has been pointing out to, why a government that celebrates 20th as a hero's day has problems in trying to literally allow the exhumation of some of those graves. She didn't mention others as a primary, a secondary school, Jiris, in which, in fact, one of the areas that are essentially used for purposes of uh, sanitation and water view lies on the graves of that. It's a history of Idi Amin and others. So that's another story altogether. So you want to understand why this consistency lies there. And in this sense, we find an easier answer by referring or going back to Wellerstein and others with respect to the tendency to capture events, I mean, issues, not in those fast moving events, but in a cyclic kind of uh, context. And that is the reason why then you tend to look at Mao Mao as people whose argument still constitutes a war of some sorts that is a long durée, in other words, continuing, even though you may want to say it is over, okay? And so in effect, we then ask ourselves, what is the role in geopolitics with respect to what you're calling the historical uh, geographers? And the basic uh, issue here is that we then seek as much as possible to run records to uh, empirical materials and all that. But in addition to that, in addition to analysis, we also want to go far into trying to understand the contemporary dynamics and try to provide aspects of projections and more specifically, uh, what you may want to call uh, options to the situation that is under, uh, under study. So notably then, we can then argue, okay, without any kind of uh, hesitation whatsoever, that Mau Mau was in fact, certainly not the last, not the first, neither was it the last resistance against what you call a Frankensteinian uh, uh, experiment that was what was called the colonial state, okay? And if we agree to that, then we'd want to see why we'd want to argue that that struggle continues in different forms by and then trying to look at two fundamental issues First, of course, is what you call the appropriation of a subjective strategic culture by the successor political elite. Uh, and that 
appropriation of that uh, subjective culture has to be looked at and traced to the whole fundamental question of what you call the rentier, inverted rentier, I mean, uh, predation. So if you invert what you call the rentierism, you end up with that kind of uh, predation, which then in our view is in fact carried forward. And to that particular extent, what you see is subjectism of the political elite, the successor political elite, which in effect then helps you to understand the consistency that explains some of these issues we are trying to look at. In that context, then we're trying to say the differentiated termite movements or resistance that come in are basically an attempt, a response in other words, to deal with the consequences of this uh, subjective strategic culture as in fact a project against a state as so designed and therefore an advance to try and look as a state as that instrument for what you may want to call liberation, what you call emancipation, emancipation of people from all aspects that constrain the ability to be able to achieve what they are capable of doing within their own context, right? And to do that then, we have to understand or to draw ourselves back to what we call the history of geography and the roots of this, what we look at later on as symbiotic and parasitic logic that exists among these groups with the elements within, within the society. And so, you have then to go back and ask yourselves, how would you conceive uh, termite movements or resistance? You have to think about them in terms of the relationship, a trifurcated relationship between them and the state elite and what you want to call the society and what you want to call security institutions. So at a certain point, you will tend to see what you may call a symbiotic relationship. In other words, to the extent to which societies find a role and a function for these groups, they operate as essentially what we call organic groups. But to the extent to which they transit and become organized to the extent that they are trying to predate on the society, they become predatory and parasitic. So there's that kind of a swing, uh, if you wish, a cascade of some kind. At a certain point, they will relate with security institutions. At certain points, they will be co-opted by political actors, especially when they're trying to gain uh, control of a political, uh, political power. And so what you're trying to say is that there is a context within which these groups have had to evolve. And they are more or less what you may want to call the reason, the failure of the reason of the state. In other words, the argument here is that a state exists for a certain purpose. It exists for purposes of trying to increase its own, what you call, its own biopower from a Foucaultian sense, that biopower is a function of what? Its ability to invest its in, in its physical base. That physical base is what we are calling the human component and the material component. For it to do that, you have to assume that it has a leadership that can be able to very quickly invest into organizational institutions that then on the basis of the ideas that exist within the state, it is in a position to be able to mediate the aspects of what output and input roles. So in the output roles are those functions that the state gives its citizens. The input aspects are more specifically in terms of its capacity to be able to extract resources from the society, which it uses for the common good, right? So now the appropriation of that subjective culture basically implies the state is permanently in a state of a crisis. And that crisis manifests in terms of its inability sometimes to operationalize and mobilize what you call its paradoxical trinity, the people, the government, and its security, and more specifically its military in terms of dealing with internal and external threats uh, in themselves. So very quickly, what then constitutes what we're calling uh, uh, a distance decay. We will have to go back to geography, uh, turbine specific, and conceive a distance decay as basically a function between, or rather a distance between two elements in space that are supposed to be related. So the further away they are from each other, the more distance they are from each other. So you can talk about social distance decay, if you are a father and every time you come to your house, your children all scatter in different directions, there is a social distance decay in that kind of a sense. If you are a state, 
and the larger part of the time you cannot be felt, there is a political distance decay. You can also have economic distance decay. You can have institutional distance decay, economic, political, and social. So in effect, what we're trying to say is that the characteristic of a distance decay uh, in a state leads to what you call uh, an operation, what you call a favorable space for all sorts of groups to survive. And uh, in effect, if you are a little bit mathematical, you can think about a distance decay and that favorable space as that square mileage plus those obstacles, economic, social, and otherwise, plus what you call uh, sanctuaries, right? Minus information, communication, and transport. So if you have that element in place, then you have a specific space for you to set up all criminal activities, right? And you can talk about it in different levels and different forms and terms. So what is important for us here is to then begin to understand how the reason of the colonial state uh, evolved this subjective culture and produced that distance decay. Because of the time factor, we will only select uh, two groups here, those we call rustlers. In reality, they're not bus rustlers, we call them bandit groups, okay, that are involved in the form of extraction. So we want to explain to you how they do exist on the basis of a hypothesis we are trying to test here. We will make a reference to others, in this case, uh, what we call Alpha Sierra, the ones who operate in the north eastern uh, uh, part of the Republic. We won't go into all those details. Others, as you have a break, you can take advantage of uh, both Ken, who in one way or another paid uh, dues to Chingororo and uh, Machuma. And of course, my friend uh, Gona here, who may have at a certain point been a member of Mulungu Nipa. They may deny, <laughs> right? So what we're trying to say over here is that in our understanding, we have to understand the forming of a state. And that forming of a state is a function of what we call the response of the geopolitical imagination of the British Empire at that particular time. So from the period of 1890, you see a declaration by the British uh, government. It's a longitudinal strategic declaration in which the British are seeking what you call hydro uh, points, hydrological points within what you're calling the Nile system. So they will declare the Nile system as what? A strategic space which implies they are willing to go to war with any other pretender. And if you are a historian, like my friends over here, you'll remember the Fashoda incident. And you will remember, of course, the, the dynamics within which after a short while, they will move into 2020, in, what, in uh, 1925, their decision to then transfer what you call the Jubaland province now to the Italians, because they have settled that aspect of the control of these uh, ideological spaces over here. So in the case of Kenya, what you're trying to say is that at a point at which they have to control these ideological spaces, they will come up with a geostrategic uh, structure. This is what you're calling the rail system. And the essence over here is that for them to be able to secure both India and uh, Egypt, you need the control of the source of the Nile. And so both the source of the Nile, the White Nile, and the source of the Blue Nile will become very fundamental here with the agreements that they end up having with Menelik for that matter. But very quickly, what we're trying to say here is that at a very given certain point, you will have all the critical uh, rivers all following under what they will call land alienation. So the logic of which land is going to be alienated is driven by that specific factor. So you have five, what you call five water towers. And those five water towers will be under the control of that component of that uh, British settler group. How does that come about? Because we've now shifted, the priorities have shifted from the geostrategic infrastructure towards what you're calling a geoeconomic infrastructure that has to be paid for. That geoeconomic infrastructure will be paid for through land alienation. And that process of land alienation will have far reaching consequences. So in the case of these constant conflicts you see in the, among the pastoralist group is our interest over here. So how do they come about? What we're trying to say here is that if you look at Kenya therefore, it is basically uh, crafted or geographed together 
by that convergence of what we are calling the southern part, right? South of the equator largely, that is not only arable, but has a large number of these water points. And that has to be linked up with the semi-arid and the arid parts of the Republic, which are more drier in that kind of a sense. And certain rivers become very fundamental. So if you're looking at the, the Western, Northwestern part of Kenya, you're talking about two rivers here, the Kerio River and the Tokwell, the Takwell River. Now, if you begin the process of predation on Mao, for instance, what ends up happening is say between 1890 and uh, 2008, what you're trying to say is that 30% of these water towers are literally erased to the ground. And the net effect is what? So the ability of, uh, uh, of these towers to hold on to water and everything is diminished. And that's why if you, for instance, if you've been reading papers, you'll hear what? The dry parts of the Republic and what? The flooding of what? The Trukana, Lake Trukana. So the basic implications over here is that the ability to retain water is limited and it has a lot of consequences. And more specifically, what you're saying is that Kenya has a tendency of having what an average of two years to three years of drought and a cycle of what? Floods. That has impacts in terms of shifting what you're calling the, the, the logic of resource access, resource denial with respect to what you call pastoralist groups. So if you look at their cosmology, their basic assumption here is that you need water and you need what you're calling grass, pastures. Now, at a certain point, if you cannot access pastures as a result of drought, then the same for purposes of sustaining the production of the society has to be responded through, through processes of what? Extraction. And so what you begin to see within the first, the colonial system are, legal frameworks, what you call outlying districts, acts and everything, uh, ordinance, which have an impact, in fact, in locking out those areas and then denying them access to education and other facilities, but more specifically transforming those spaces with respect to the behavior that is happening to what you're calling these hydro spaces. So the net effect is what? Increasingly, you begin to see more militarized reactions with these groups trying to access these resources. The post-independent state is even more interesting. So instead of uh, the, the reason of state being the securitization of its population, the state outsources security to the communities through what you're calling what? The police reserve. These are a bunch of characters with all multiplicities of different types of unfitting uniforms. Several of them are poorly trained, poorly led, and all of them at a certain point finding themselves appropriated by the community. So that process of appropriating them by the community is what is constituting what you call the symbiotic relationship between them and the community. But at a certain point, especially in the period of the nineties, the dynamics of democratization, which would presuppose the opening up of associational spaces leads to the opposite situation within which the political elite at that particular time are seeking to what? To, to claw back on the opening spaces. And one way of that is a phenomena within which the inverted predatory rentier system begins to work. So a large number of these groups will, will be facilitated in their raids, right? So if you want to understand the political economy over here, think about a study that we did at a certain point in which you're talking of uh, a period of 10 years 300,000 herds of cattle are stolen. And out of that 300, not stolen. Let me change my word, it's not stolen, appropriated. And out of that 300,000, multiply that with what? 10,000. So you end up with 3 billion. That's a bandit economy that is evolving. So these guys are able to get some resources out of it. The political leaders are able to get political power and support of the ground. The national government is able to do what? To lock out spaces again as those it did not conceive pliable to their orientation at that time. So these dynamics, when we place the map all together, what you begin to see is the increasing militarization and that aspect of the militarization itself will go hand in hand with the predation by the same elite 
on what you're calling hydrospaces in themselves. And the net result of it is that, how many minutes do I have? One minute, okay. So if you're given one minute to say everything else you want to say, uh, you might just basically want to read out and simply say, okay, so in Northwestern, you can talk about, especially Western province, you can talk about support liberation uh, defense forces, SLDF. You know the story about it. And you can uh, make reference to 89 illegal groups that were supposed to have been banned in 2016. There are very many of them with all numbers. So the basic aspect here is that depending on whether they have become organized or they are uh, what you're calling termite uh, and uh, organic in nature, they will articulate certain interests and those interests will in one way or another revolve around that question of access, more specifically space. So if you give me an extra minute, I will just find out from the guy, oh, so move for a little bit, excuse, excuse the regional, uh, move a little bit. Okay, so let's begin with this map here, All right? So this is what you call uh, the geographical, the critical space in 1890 that the British are declaring theirs. This is the Nile system, okay? And the Nile system shapes itself within what you may want to call the, the Horn of Africa and the Great Lakes subsystem. So the critical aspect over here in terms of the rivers, river systems will also shape the identity question we have in the region. And so if you look at it in terms of its consequences, you begin to see why the whole struggle of the whole disagreements between uh, Egypt and uh, Ethiopia basing themselves on what you call the guard uh, revolves. Let's move down. Okay, so these subsystems and the legs, I mean, and the rivers are what we are trying to say holds the whole phenomena you're calling uh, Kenya. So in effect, the argument here is that this uh, predation on uh, environmental systems have the potential challenges of actually collapsing the state or in fact integrating it and integrating the entire region. So what you're saying is that to integrate for survival, viable state, it implies you have to reconstitute what you call the Nile system in its core, if you wish. So if you move down a little bit, uh, you're basically talking about the dynamics you're talking about in terms of uh, access to water, and the consequences continue down, All right? So if you look at this space over here, you'll see the dynamics of the struggles among these groups to try and uh, re uh, reassure themselves of their own self reproduction through processes of extraction by force. Down completely. Uh -oh. This one, 20, 20. Yep, yep. Do I need to explain to you that? Pardon? With your permission? Yeah. So at this point, all these groups are trying to protect what you call a collective heritage, the survival of the collectivity. And this implies that uh, if you look at them, they have their marine component, they have uh, assault weapons, all of them. This is a G3, this is an AK-47. And at a certain point, they give themselves the phenomenon of what you call the morale. If you're going into war, you must cite yourself. So the basic aspect over here is that if droughts have uh, eliminated a large percentage of your resources, then the only other way to gain them is to extract them by force from those who may still be having the same. So one basic way of resolving this issue is not even deploying the GSU and all those aspects, is ensuring that they have access to those, that water. And do I need to finish up the whole story? Every time there is an attempt to build dams, you know where the dams, they actually get built, but they get built in what? People's pockets. So uh, thanks so much, Professor Katumanga. Musa Bayi for that a, a resourceful presentation. There is much probably I can be able to see about your presentation, but simply because I'm not the discussant, I'll be opening up uh, the floor to the discussants when that time comes. Thanks so much. Let's appreciate Professor Mutia Bayi well. 
So we, uh, we, we have our last presenter for this session. His name is Dr. Eliud Biegon. Eliud is coming from Department of History and Archaeology, History, Archaeology and Political Science in Kenyatta University. And he told me that he teaches history. So welcome, Biegon. Thank you very much, Tabitha. Uh, after listening to such a dense and uh, eminent scholarship uh, and being the last one, I feel a bit nervous. Uh, Ken, I think you put me in trouble. <laughs> Uh, I hope I will measure up to your to, to your needs. First, we uh, I'm from KU, and there's a KU contingent here: uh, Dr. Kakai, Dr. Peter Wafula Wekesa. They are seated at the back. Uh, we are very happy to be here. Uh, we some of our colleagues went to school here, so they are at home, and uh, we consider you as our sister department. And we thank you very much for this invite. And we hope to do justice to this topic of the day. Second is, is, is to thank all of you for coming here and for, for lending me your ears. And I would uh, also thank those who are online for, for staying put. Uh, I don't take it for granted. I, I appreciate your presence here. Uh, also, it's a good idea to see familiar faces. Uh, my neighbor and scholar, uh, Dr. Ruth Mweni Muli, uh, whom I will say some things that she may have witnessed, and I hope uh, that she will have. She will, I will be right when I say that. Uh, and also Faith, uh, whom I've worked with before in in KLA. So thank you all, and I'm I'm, I'm glad. Uh, my presentation will will uh, carry on from a point that was made by uh, Angugi. Mwiru. I don't know that Ngugi Mwiru is still around. Uh, Ngugi Mwiru made an important reference, which I, I was not familiar with, uh, but which, which is, is, is quite important in what I'm going to say, uh, that the, the election of 2022, if you can put up the, the slides, slides, yes, Eliud Biagon, the election of 2022 was uh, a revolutionary of to Mundus against Andu. Uh, this this was 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 uh, an important statement made by by the the practitioner in journalism. And uh, essentially, what I'm trying to do is to talk about conversations and observations that I made during this election. So I am bringing us to the present. But as a historian, I would like to draw the observations that I made and the history that, we are, that has brought us here, the history of the Mau Mau. I do not want to belabor the point or stretch the link so much, uh, but I will speak about this conversation. And this is an ongoing project. It's an ongoing uh, conversation. I will speak about them and hope to draw some tentative conclusions of what I think are important connections uh, between the conversations that I was hearing during this election among a specific group and the, the history of the Mau Mau movement, you know, that brought us here. So quickly, I will want to do the following. Uh, so if you can go to slide number two, uh, I will talk about how this project was conceived. I hope to take a very short time. Uh, I, will, I hope to, to ask my main questions. So what are the, the main questions of this project? And how did I, how am I collecting my data? This is an ongoing issue. Uh, where am I at with this project? Uh, and I will give tentative findings. So whatever I will say are tentative. And then I will make concluding remarks where I will try to stretch a little bit and project into, into, into what I think uh, the group of people that I am, I, I am in conversation with think or what they project concerning uh, the issue of, of, of politics 
in the country, but also the issue of, of, of Mau Mau. So if you go to my second slide, how this project was conceived. So in the midst of this 2022 election, before, slightly before and during, especially during the election, when we had the controversy, the Supreme Court, there was a group of, of, of young men, uh, I think there were maybe one or two ladies. Uh, the lady is the one who was operating that Kibanda kiosk, but there were mainly young men who were, would meet in, in, a, in Bellevue uh, taxi stop just below that footbridge. And uh, most of them were the taxi drivers, uh, the taxis that are parked right there. So the taxi drivers and uh, border border operators and, uh, and uh, vendors of, 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 of clothes who sell clothes there, uh, shoe repairer. And uh, there was a lady who, owned, who owns that Kibanda. Uh, the privilege I had is that one of the taxi drivers who was very active in this is a, is a very good friend of mine. Uh, he's been driving me around this city for as long as I can remember. And so I have had conversations with him about politics, about tribalism, ethnicity, if you want to use a safer word, and many things. So this gentleman is the one with whom I was carrying out this, this conversation. And this group of people were talking in Kikuyu language. Now, I do not speak Kikuyu, and I do not understand it. So that was a bit uh, difficult. But every time I would pass there, I, uh, I would see that they were in, in very uh, heavy conversation. You can see a group of people who are focusing, listening to one person and making their contribution. And this was happening almost daily, especially during the Supreme Court case. Later on, uh, I, I would try to eavesdrop, but then I realized they are speaking Kikuyu and I cannot understand it. So, and, and the language and the conversation appeared to be very thick. I think Ibrahim Mohammed talks about the thick of a conversation or the thick of an interview. It appeared to be very thick. So I thought maybe I would be an unwelcome guest in that kind of conversation. But I was obviously provoked by this, this event and uh, I, I was eager to to try and, and, and understand what was going on. And this is where my friendship with Godfrey Mwangimburu, I'm mentioning his name with, with permission, uh, became very important because he was involved in this. He's a taxi driver. And we would speak about uh, the events of the day uh, during this time. So, so this is how, uh, this project came to me. The conversation was about elections. Uh, this group of people were Kikuyu speakers and upfront they were supporters of, of, of uh, one part. Yes, um, yes, main questions here. Yeah, one, they were, they were supporters of, of the, the, the president, the current president, William Ruto. So they were, they were not uh, apologizing about it. And they, their uh, speech were about revolve around this issue of, of Asla, of Hasla, you know, Hasla movement, Hasla narrative, and they were explaining their situation or their condition. And, and, uh, and these conversations I thought were important because some people took this Hasla thing very lightly. The other side of the political competition would dismiss Hasla by giving uh, dictionary narratives a hustler is, is somebody who gets things through uh, deceitful means, somebody who tries to acquire property or, or, or money through quick and deceit, deceitful means. So they would give this kind of definitions. But this, uh, the people that were in this particular group were all happy to be called hustlers. Godfrey Mburu is very happy to be called a hustler. That's where my question uh, began, you know. Why uh, do you call yourself hustler? What does this mean to you? That was an important question uh, for me in this context. And uh, the next question, which is related to this one is, this is a redundant question is, what was your choice in the presidential election? Uh, and what informed this choice? So I was, ex I was trying to expand what connections these people were making between this uh, 
very outward self-identification as, as hustlers and what they were very upfront about, their choice of William Ruto for president. This one, there was no doubt about it in, 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 this, in this group. So my, how I collect, collect this information, uh, uh, as, as I've said, is, is uh, I just hung out around uh, this particular informant. I have, um, I have this particular friend of mine who is Kikuyu from Gatundu, and whom I, I, I speak to frequently. And we just talk informally uh, over, over, over the issues, over the issues that, that uh, rotate around this definition of hustler and, and, and that election. But over time, I have also gained access uh, to, to other people who are known to Mburu, but who are also in the neighboring places. So South B is the opposite side of, of, of South C, where there, there are also other people who had this kind of, of congregations. I do not have many informants and I do not hope to have many informants. I hope to talk to uh, as few as 10 or maybe less. My main direction of travel with, 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 with what I'm seeing is rather to explore the, 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 the beliefs and the attitudes and, 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 and uh, what connections my informants are making between this conversation and the history, the historical issues that surround uh, uh, the Mau Mau movement, because this came up, this issue came up in this, in this, in this conversation. And so uh, where the project is at now is I have uh, five people that I, I am in active conversation with one lady. This is the only person who does not identify as a hustler. Uh, all the other four up front identify themselves. They say, I, am, I, I consider myself uh, to be a hustler. And, and uh, the lady does not, uh, she lives in a fairly nice flat uh, in, in South B. Uh, but most of my informants are taxi drivers, uh, border border operators, and uh, uh, a, a, a maize, a person who, who sells maize, uh, a food vendor, and this kind of people. This is the direction of travel. I, have, I hope that I will not expand uh, this project too much. I think uh, this, the, the kind of interviews that lead one to another and, and confidence building uh, is what is more important in leading me to explore uh, the information that I'm given. So what are my tentative, explan the tentative explanations that were given to me uh, for the presidential vote? So I'll give the tentative findings or the, the, the what came out, the themes that came out of these conversations. I, I may not want to name uh, some names unless ones that are very obvious and are under the public uh, domain. But one thing that stood out, that one thing that came out from my conversations was, was uh, the, economic, the economic explanations for the choice of a presidential vote and, uh, and uh, how these people are explaining their economic condition and how this was directly related to their, 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 their vote. And here I got, I was surprised that I, uh, people who do informal business were able to talk about uh, big infrastructure projects. Uh, some of them could even mention who are the, uh, the people doing the infrastructure projects, the projects, the SGR, uh, the expressway and all these uh, big inf infrastructure project. They could talk about banks, you know, uh, uh, Godfrey uh, Muru could talk about banks and how banks have exchanged hands uh, from one uh, uh, person to a family or, or owned now by a family and how this has, has affected how they are able to access loans uh, to do their taxi business. Uh, these people are able to talk about food industry, for example, milk processing and how 
uh, the milk processing uh, business has been dominated uh, by, by one family in, in, in area where they, they came from and how this has affected uh, how they are able to do their own business. They were talking about online taxi, what you call Uber and Bolt and these kind of companies. And especially for the taxi drivers, uh, the particular complaint for them was that uh, they were they are not able to raise their issues uh, with the relevant authorities. Uh, they even say some of these companies don't even have offices here. Uh, and when they try to raise issues with ones which are here, they are not heard, and they are not acted upon. And they come to the conclusion that these companies uh, have people who have invested in them, who are in high office, and therefore they are blocked, uh, they, they are kind of protected. So people cannot raise their voice. So these informants were raising a catalog of issues that they thought affected them directly. This was an important thing for them, the, the, the economic situation and how, it is, how they relate it uh, to the people high up in government. Now, my aim here, and this I borrow from Lewis White, is not to establish the truth that a company has been bought by the first family, for example, and therefore, because this is so, the people who work in this company are not able to raise complaints. Whenever they raise complaints, they are not heard. It's not my business to know the, to establish that truth. I may want to do that as a matter of course, but I'm, I'm borrowing from Lewis White to say, uh, to, uh, to make the argument that uh, rumors and hearsays and claims and allegations that are made by individuals in, in, a, in a society or in a community sometimes gain a force, a certain force of their own. And that way, individuals begin to act, make decisions and mobilize around this information. So the information may be true or it may not be true. But the important thing is, does this information have a social force? Are people mobilizing around it? And I can say uh, that uh, out of my, my conversations uh, with my uh, interviewee, the key issues that, the key issue I think that comes up is, is the economy, the economic situation and the number of, of, of business concerns that are engaged in business and that they think are undercutting them as small businessmen. They call themselves small business people and that their interests are not met. <laughs> How many minutes? I should be done, okay. So uh, if you go to the next slide, I will do this in one minute. So another issue that is raised is the attitude of, 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 of attitude towards the leading personalities. Uh, this in the elections and the leading personalities were, were definitely these, these three. And there are very strong sentiments that are expressed about these people. And some of these sentiments have relevance to the discussions we have had. Another one is, is, uh, is the idea that the Kikuyu people want to free themselves from the shackles or from being from the control of one family. This one I, I could mention uh, because this was this was mentioned quite a lot. And I think it is something that is up the, out there in the in the in the air. But there's a yearning for freedom from control uh, by this this uh, this this one people, this one uh, uh, kind of family. The, the narrative of dynasty and 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 hustler comes there. Let me just read my, my, what I call my tentative conclusion. I just read it, it will be one minute. In post-independence Kenya, the Kikuyu have always had one kind or the other of class politics. That is slide number 11. This undoubtedly is a legacy of the post-Mau Mau and post-independence political settlement. 
even though it may draw back to deeper Kikuyu histories, Kikuyu cultural concepts like Itwika, generational change, cleansing of the sins of the fathers, is an indication that there existed some kind of class politics long before the colonial period. The, 1920, the, the 2022 presidential election politics, especially the rhetoric around Hustler, provided perhaps the clearest tendency yet towards a class politics that was mobilized and deployed, at least among the Kikuyu in Nairobi that I interviewed. Whether this was a one-off or that this is a tendency that will fade off is not clear. To some like politician Jimmy Wanjigi, the 2022 general election was an Itwika moment. This man said this a lot. And that internal Kikuyu politics thereafter will settle for the next generation. The second point here is that there were clear appropriation of narratives of the oppressor and the oppressed. This, this uh, was a frequent trope in, this, in my discussions. The exploiter and the exploited, so-called hustler versus dynasty. And thirdly, there is a clear attempt to associate the hustler term with a Kikuyu civic virtue of sweated labor and hard work. Somebody who wakes up and go and work hard to earn their income. I think what uh, John Lonsell calls uh, civil, civic virt 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 uh, virtue. Perhaps the success or not of the people who purvey this hustler narrative will depend on how credibly they can draw from these deeper Kikuyu histories of class politics, of generation, and of civic virtue. I think I will take the conversations in, in questions. And sorry, sorry for taking too much time, but thank you very much for listening. So we appreciate you, Dr. Eliot Biegon, for that presentation. It's actually a, a very recent presentation, a very recent presentation in our political arena. And since time is not on our side, I open up now the forum uh, to the discussants, and I'll be starting with uh, the Faith, uh, Madam Faith Alubes presentation, where we have Mr. David Masika as the discussant. David, we have you have only five minutes to discuss <laughs> Madame Alube's work. Thank you very much, uh, the moderator. Uh, as she said, I'm David Masika. Uh, I'm going to take very short time because of Bye. the interest of time. Uh, Faith Alube raised key questions and linked them to Mau Mau that 70 years since the struggle or the beginning of the struggle, these questions are still hung around us. And key among these is transitional justice that even uh, and under transitional justice, she raised the question of the narrative around Mau Mau. And that takes us back to what we have been asking from the beginning of this seminar, who's Mau Mau? Because there seems not to be a clear agreement on who owns which narrative. And again, she related it to the question of central, uh, central Kenya ownership of the narrative of liberation that many of what comes out is ownership of the debate of liberation by the people of central Kenya and leaving others. Then she gave examples of other territories that literally also struggled and no one is talking about them. And that's why she posed the question, who will speak about these people and gave example of Trukana struggle. Uh, there is also Samburu struggle related to the Loroki uh, plateau, but no one talks about it. Uh, and that therefore leads us to maybe another question of 
who controls the state? Is it that the person who controls or the group that controls the state also controls the narrative? Uh, she went ahead and raised the question of land that Mau Mau fought for land. It was key among their struggle and many other groups that uh, she gave uh, examples. But then was the land, is the land question dealt with? Have we, did the people who struggled for the land finally get uh, the land? Uh, and she related it with the land policies that we inherited from the colonial government. And indeed, uh, she gave examples of uh, little has changed when it comes to the land policy. We seem to just be inheriting it, following it to the uh, bitter end to where we are. And that reminds me, even with the new constitution of 2010, which gave a room to constitute the land commission, the land commission becomes one of the most feared commission for one to one to work with together with the electoral commission. Because sometimes when you join the land commission tomorrow the scandal, you have a scandal and tomorrow you are in court and you might end up not even serving six months in that uh, commission. She raised the question of multinationals who still control huge chunks of land, who is going to ask? Who is going to pose the questions about the owners, the original owners of this land? She also brought in the question of women, which uh, my teacher, Dr. Gashi, I don't know whether she's in, she has written a lot about Mau Mau, and she raised a key question of, yes, the women played a major role in the struggle, of Mau Mau, but no one is asking about what they went through. They went through the abuses within uh, the camp. And this also resonates close. And I think Faith must have done a connection with South Africa. If you look at the Omhonto Oasis, where you see the same narratives coming up, that yes, women were in the struggle, why in Omhonto Oasis, but then there were violations within Omhonto Oasis and no one is talking about it. No one is talking about it. Uh, and that also reminded me, why then have we not gone the DRC way? Why am I saying the DRC way? The, the UN missions have been operating in DRC uh, from 1960s. And they seem to have left so many babies there that as we speak, there is a, a, an NGO, NGOs in DRC, which are the main objective is trace their fathers. Trace their fathers. Where are their fathers? Then uh, she raised the question of restitution uh, and uh, that goes hand in hand. Uh, and she posed a question that, is it even in the colonial jurisdiction that they should do all this or they should uh, compensate and we should push them to the wall to uh, be responsible for the crimes they committed. But then uh, I think uh, I'm finishing. Faith should have raised my five minutes and not it over. We've just done two. <laughs> uh, and then Joyce, uh, Faith should have even uh, posed the question, who should push for this narrative? Uh, more than 60 years after independence, our governments have not even pushed this narrative. It is efforts from individuals that are coming up and saying, no, the British should compensate here, they should compensate here. And the British seem to have gone round for those who have read the, uh, the landmine, the Ottawa Convention, when the, the convention comes in force and they say, okay, the affected countries where the landmines are, will take responsible responsibility to demine their territories. Yet who planted the mines? So the British seem to have gone round and left the burden to the uh, post-colonial uh, state. She also posed the questions of documentations that we really 60 years and more after independence, there are documents we can't afford to access. 
and that even when they were in the archive, they have disappeared. And I agree with you. I went to the archive and those documents, most of them have disappeared. I was even shocked when I went to parliament and we discussed about disappearance of those documents. And we were even told that the collection within parliament was carried away by the contractor who took it away as rubbish. Took it away as rubbish. So uh, those documentation, and finally, uh, she mentioned the question of lease holds, which are still hovering around us, 60 and above years after independence multinationals still hold land. Who is going to ask for the commoners who lost the land? Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Uh, Mr. David Masika for your observation on that. Now I am going to call the discussant for Professor Katumanga Musa Bayi Suwak. That will be done by Dr. Ken Obogi and Dr. George Rona. You have five minutes, and the, half mi the five minutes will be shared by the two of you. That is 2.5 minutes to 2.5 minutes starting now. All right. Uh, we vote for Uhuru. Um, uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Tabitha. Um, uh, um, Chris was uh, my classmate, uh, and uh, we, we have come a long way together. And um, every so often, uh, when we have these discussions uh, about the state in Africa, I admire the graphic uh, descriptions. Uh, that he always gives uh, about the uh, about what Masrui called uh, at some point the African condition. Now, in his presentation this afternoon, he uh, delved into quite a number of things. But uh, what appeared to be of very strong interest to me is um, uh, what I see as um, the intersections of uh, the state geopolitics and the pagans for power by informal and non-state uh, actors. And, and, and that is uh, very interesting, especially when you look at the anatomy, quote unquote, of the state uh, in Africa uh, and, and uh, its development. And this is the case both uh, in um, colonial, uh, in, in, in Africa's uh, colonial period and Africa's uh, post-colony. Uh, but then uh, uh, the, the, the African post-colonial state is uh, a fairly poor replica of its colonial predecessor, uh, especially if you look at um, uh, the, the issues of um, uh, uh, the, the power uh, to control and uh, uh, the power to, uh, to, to dominate. And, and this argument, uh, fundamentally, if I understood you very well, uh, 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 has resonance to uh, one, of course, uh, the idea that I'm sure you know very well, Delosi and uh, Francois Bayer's uh, 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 you know, instrumentalization of this order uh, and the idea of uh, Africa works, uh, for, for those of you who, who have looked at these works, that um, there is a way in which um, in, in political mobilization and uh, political dominance, uh, we, our political elites have weaponized the violence. Uh, so, so the order is actually uh, uh, violence in Africa, which is a fairly utilitarian uh, 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 approach to disorder by, uh, the political elites. Number two, this has resonance to uh, what some scholars have called the minimalist state in Africa, uh, which of course I agree with you, uh, has a lot of interface uh, with the geopolitical uh, influence and uh, uh, has less legitimacy uh, at the grassroots uh, level. Uh, there is always a facade of uh, the dominance of the state 
uh, in, 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 even in our own country. Uh, when um, I, I did some interviews last in the North uh, East of, of Kenya, one respondent um, actually mentioned something that was very striking, uh, that wakati serikali ilikuwa hapa mwisho, when the state was here last, uh, that's somebody within the uh, territorial boundaries of, of, of Kenya, talking about when the state was here last, uh, referring to the intermittent uh, 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 reactionary approach uh, to security issues, which uh, 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 Professor uh, very ably uh, referred to. Now, um, uh, having said that, very quickly I'm finishing, um, the, 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 the long durée, uh, which is of course uh, uh, proposed by the annals uh, uh, histories and then their main agenda of the totalizing uh, uh, project, uh, which is based on social history, uh, you know, mainly of uh, emphasizes uh, people uh, and dynamics which influence structures and, and, and events. Uh, if, if I understand uh, the, the annals, uh, historiography well, uh, then uh, you, you lost me a little bit uh, when uh, 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 social aggregates and events uh, didn't seem to occupy a prominent uh, place in, in your thinking and, and presentation. Instead, you strongly projected your politics uh, and the dynamics that uh, come with that. And I'm having in mind, uh, Prof. Uh, Michel Foucault uh, in his work, The History of Madness, which I, I'm sure you have interacted with uh, by being French trained. Now, uh, you, you know, lastly, um, I, I, I find interesting your view that, um, uh, you know, about the servitude of uh, history to, to political science. Uh, um, and uh, that, that approach was based on uh, your understanding of the of our emphasis of events by historians. Uh, but my understanding of uh, uh, the idea we call historical specificity uh, in, in, in uh, a critical philosophy of history, the essence of history is a space, time, and agency. And uh, within that matrix of space, time, and agency, uh, events uh, play a very minimal uh, role. And, and I, I, I think Professor Mickey will agree with me on this. Uh, so so I, I thought uh, that, that that was important for me uh, to, to, to mention, and thank you very much. Chris, uh, Chris has a way of complicating things. And uh, we, we do a lot of uh, discussion on, uh, over these uh, ideas on Sundays, uh, somewhere in uh, the junction. But I, I'll, I'll just follow uh, on what uh, Dr. Mbongi has just raised and, and think, ask questions and not, not discuss. Um, I have three uh, questions. One is uh, using uh, the concept of termite literally, that uh, termites build uh, those long brown uh, structures. At some point when rain uh, falls on them, uh, they disintegrate. Now, at what extent do these uh, 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 movements that you talk about uh, have ever disintegrated? It looks like uh, they are rosy and they continue doing very well. So, so uh, kindly speak to that. And secondly, uh, these termites uh, movements, you, you, you say they have collective uh, memory and heritage. What, what does that mean? 
when you say this, you know, the, the movements in Northern Kenya and all that, and I'm, I'm making reference to uh, the movements that I've, I've, I've researched on uh, the, the underground and all that. So what, what kind of collective memory and, um, and heritage do they have? And, and thirdly, now that you, we're dealing with Mau Mau, uh, to what extent do these termites movement make reference or as, have aspirations and are inspired by Mau Mau? Thank you. So thanks so much, uh, Dr. Kenneth Obogi and Dr. George Gona for your observation on Professor Gatumaga's work. Now I call Mr. Justice Odigi as a discussant on Dr. Eliud Biegon's Bieg work. Welcome, Justice. Uh, thank you, uh, Tapta, for the uh, for uh, the welcome. So I'm here to just have a quick uh, uh, discussion on uh, Dr. Eliud's uh, presentation. Uh, a bit current. He's talking about the 2022 uh, elections. Talking about uh, the hustler, so to speak, and how that narrative sold among us the Kikuyu in Nairobi. I think that was the title of his work. So. Uh, from a starting point, he was talking about that uh, 2022 at the presidential level elections in Kenya was some kind of revolution uh, between, I think, what he called the Tumundus against uh, the Andus. I hope I got that right. Maybe to some degree, yes. Uh, but I think as time goes by, we'll be able to get much more information. So, but I think the most important bit is about the conversations that shape our elections uh, in Kenya and I think around the world. Uh, and I think that's very critical. Uh, and at the end of the day, then it's like these conversations are driven by a number of highlights, including the existing circumstances. And I think at some point he drew in the issue about the economy and, of course, our history and, of course, prior experiences. And I think then the likes of Mamao to come in when talk about the 2022 elections. Uh, and having said that, I began by what basically drew him to the project, as he called it, about uh, his guy, the taxi driver, I think, Mburu. Uh, and maybe all of us have uh, different experiences on the same. Uh, so maybe uh, let me mention this on that. Sometime back in 20, uh, sorry, sometime back in 2008, I happened to be somewhere in Nyandarua, uh, in and around where one jam karaoke is uh, buried. Uh, and this was in the aftermath of the 2007 elections. Uh, and uh, as I was walking around there, I was seeing somebody from, the, from my home who was you know, kind of stationed there. It was very interesting that uh, the people around there already uh, decided on your next president uh, in, the next, uh, five, in the next election cycle. And that was going to be Uhuru Kenyatta, interestingly. And it was about uh, his hand during the 2007-2008 uh, violence and the help supposedly he gave to the Akikuyu people. Uh, there's a story about him sending trucks uh, to the Rift Valley to basically rescue uh, the Gikuyu people. Very interesting. Uh, and I, I, I call out my friend again in, um, after the 2017 elections. Uh, and interestingly, uh, it was not then different. Uh, the name William Ruto was already in the hearts of those people. Right, way before the handshake. Very interesting about some of these things. Hopefully, I think this is a new uh, kind of field uh, that uh, researchers can get into. But having said that, at the end of the day, these conversations are shaped by elites, the political players. Uh, and at the end of the day, as of the citizens basically then engage in that uh, debate, that conversation, and then we analyze it, including what we, we are doing here. I think we're just citizens. So we are not in that class uh, that basically shapes Kenya as it were at that presidential level. Uh, and then uh, having said that, um, 2022, again, as he said, uh, Dr. Eliud, uh, was about the economy. He talked about the merge of the banks, about the taxi businesses, and uh, I think he tried to allude to the first family. I've heard about that. I've not given any name. 
uh, but I've heard about Uber and uh, some some and, and the ownership and all that. I think uh, that's good enough for now. Uh, and then there's something about some farm. If you come from where I come from, uh, we drive through Narok. Uh, there's some long things. Uh, you have driven to Narok from Nairobi, from Maimayu, on two sides of the highway. Uh, and there's been a story about that. Uh, and then that SGR station there. Again, uh, I think it adds up to what Eliud was alluding to, right? There's a way then at the end of the day that uh, when you have these elections, a number of things uh, kind of converge and end up shaping uh, this presidential election. And the 2022 was not an exception. Uh, and even and the elections we have had before have not been any different. Um, so, but again, but 2022 again brought about the issue of like a, a, a class debate, uh, which eventually be to some degree, maybe you can say brought about the divide, and then it worked to uh, to the advantage of then our new or current president, as it were. So maybe towards the end, I can say that uh, there were two major candidates in 2022 in the presidential election: one Raira Molodinga and one William Ruto, uh, and uh, probably. I may not be wrong to say that uh, William Ruto saw that opportunity pretty early on, was able to brand himself well, uh, and his message was able to resonate very well with the people. I think Elliot is talking about Tiagikuyu. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the day, when the numbers came home and the dust was settled, uh, you have His Excellency William Samoy Ruto. But again, uh, at the end of the day, that is not very new in Kenya. I remember Kenny Matiba way back in 1992, who almost also got the presidency. This way I branded himself. I can't remember his slogan, uh, but uh, he, he was quite a force in 1992, right? And Moy had to escape with that something percent of the presidential vote, if you guys remember well. And then Rodinga 2007, the debate continues. Did he win? Did he lose? I don't know. But uh, okay, maybe one day we'll know, right? And that's, of course, adds up to. Barack Obama, the change, the guy of change in 2008 US uh, presidential elections. And when the votes again were counted, he was home, right? And before, before I stop, uh, I remember just, just by the way, uh, way back in 2008 or 2007, when Barack Obama, I've just gone a bit away from what you're talking about here, uh, decided, announced that he was going to run for the presidency in some, I think, town in Illinois. It was already the Senate of Illinois, and of course, the Senate of the US. Uh, I remember hearing that, I think it was on Capital FM. And I remember two guys who were presenting there in the afternoon. I can't remember the title of the, of, of, uh, of the, of the program. Because they drive on Capital FM. But then Capital FM radio station had this very good uh, English or grammar back then. Uh, and I remember the guys who were presenting laughing hard. Uh, about a black guy dreaming of becoming a president in the US. Uh, one of them was uh, Leo, one of them was, the other one was called Marcus. Very interesting, but at the end of this about branding, as I think uh, that's what uh, Eliud will come up, will, will some degree uh, talk about, is very key among as many other dynamics in winning an election. So we'll wait and see what Eliud comes up. Uh, when John is done, we're talking the likes of Umburu and the other hustlers uh, in Nairobi and out they voted in 2022, Kenya's presidential election. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Justa Sodigi, for your observation. Now I open the, the, the forum for questions. We are going to take two questions, two questions and from this audience, and then we are going to take two questions from our online audience. So the first question, I, I'll be giving an, an opportunity to Dr. George Gona. I'll, I'll be gender sensitive. The second one you'll be coming from a lady seated behind. She told me she works in Kriyanyaga. So welcome, Dr. George. Uh, this, this question is to Eliud. Uh, Eliud has discussed very recent uh, developments, um, and I'm, I'm concerned with his methodology. Um, there's something called historical gossip. That is, I think, that's what he's engaging. This is using historical gossip, right? Which, uh, which is good. <laughs> However, he, he talks about debating with uh, Mburu, and having a conversation. So, so I, I'm not sure whether that's really method, methodologically correct. 
if it's conversational, that is okay. But when you start debating with your informant, then I don't think you're doing history or you're doing research, right? Just sit, sit with them, listen as historical gossip. That is okay. Make sense out of what they're saying. But when you begin debating with them, then what are you involved in? Is that research? No. Secondly, uh, this, this is very contemporary. And uh, contemporary debates or contemporary history, I don't know how far we can go. But my, my worry is that uh, you will be, and I think that's, that's what Justice was trying to say, you, you just be uh, parodying what everybody's saying. What, what is the measure of, uh, of course you, you acknowledge that is subjectivity, but that's running away from the, the reality. You, you are actually covering yourself from the criticism that we, we are raising. That uh, the, 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 no, I know this is subjective and therefore you will excuse me. No, we are not excusing you, uh, do a good job. Right, uh, it's it's very it's a good good research, but I don't know how much uh, will come out of it. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Leah Wangeshin Jaroge. I come from Kirinyaga County. And uh, my question will go to Faith. I come from a county whereby we have a lot of question, or the community still have a lot of question. And I would ask Faith, myself being a victim of what is being spoken today, about the Mau Mau, because we happened to, uh, to be the victim whereby my grandfather, three grandfathers were killed during that uh, 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 Mau Mau freedom fighter, fighting. I'm asking, uh, which is the way forward? Because we didn't get justice. When our grandfather were killed and we were told that they were killed, we didn't get justice. We have never buried them. We never knew even where they are. At some point, we wrote a letter to the museums of Kenya to try and give us at least, even if it's a museum whereby we can be going to celebrate or to honor them on Mashujade. So we are asking, uh, which is the way forward for us? Because we still have so much pain in us. Talking of our grandfather, it's not even that generation, it's second generation. We have not found justice. Where is the justice? So uh, your question will be addressed. So we are going to pick two onla online audience. I don't know whether we have a question on board. Any question from our online viewers? Can you, can, see you me? Can, you see me? can you see me? Can you see me? Yes, Dr. Francis Owaka. Yes. Thank you, madam. Mine is not actually a question, but uh, to appreciate the entire conference, it has been very informative, very debating. Uh, I think we benefited, those of us who are interested in history, particularly the, the, the historiographical facts that have come out and the analysis that have been presented. Um, I wanted to make a comment alongside what George pointed out, George Gona, Dr. Gona's comment. 
Yes, we engage our informants, but the engagement should not be in such a way that we are debating them. Because what, what would be the methodological uh, position in debating an, an, info, an informant? Uh, we could engage them in a bid to, to seek to establish a position uh, through uh, question answer session. But supposing I engaged him by Uh, Dr. Waka, we are not able to hear him. I don't know whether Dr. Gona, you have been able to grasp the question so that we can proceed. So can we proceed? Yes, we, we are going to give, uh, is it five minutes? It's, so we are going to give three minutes to each of the presenter. So I'll be starting with uh, Dr. Biegon, who, who will be addressing question asked by uh, Dr. George Gona. Uh, 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 Dr. Biegon will be followed by Professor Katumanga. We will also be addressing question that, three questions that were raised by Dr. Gona. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, sorry, Professor Katumanga will be followed <laughs> by uh, Alube, Alube is gone. I can't see Alube to be able to address, to address, he will be addressing Alube's question. So uh, if Alube will be on, online, you'll be addressing uh, the, the lady from Kirenyaga County's question. So we start with Dr. Biegon, welcome. Thank you very much. Dr. Biegon? Yes. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Uh, David Addison, Addison, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself to ask the question. Hello. Yes, I, I was. I was very moved by the the lady at the back of the room about her grandfather's remains and the problems that her family has had trying to find closure around that experience. I've heard similar tales from many Kenyans over many years. And yet it continues to shock me that although there is much talk of reconciliation and of the need to heal the wounds of Mau Mau, some very obvious things that might be done in Kenya to do that are simply ignored. So let me give one example. The young lady mentioned the National Museum of Kenya, and she may be aware that the National Museum of Kenya holds the remains of 487 Kikuyu people, human remains. These are people who were assassinated by Mau Mau during the emergency. And the remains were kept by the police pathology department because they were needed as evidence in court cases. When the pathologist left Kenya in 1959, those remains were transferred to the museum as an ontology collection. They are still there now, even though for many of those remains, we know the names of those people. We know who they were. They're not anonymous. There's a card index with the remains that identifies many of them. Now, I've argued before, and I put this in the last few pages of my book, History of the Hanged, why on earth aren't those remains buried? And why can't the families have closure? Well, when this has been discussed in Kenya in the past, one of the issues that is brought up is that those remains are the wrong kind of remains. They're not Mau Mau heroes, they're loyalists. 
Well, to my mind, if we're going to be talking about reconciliation, and I think we should be, that should make not one bit of difference. They are Kenyans who lost their lives in that struggle. They should be respected and commemorated and given proper burial. They presently sit in a state institution. They should not be there. So I think it's one example of something that Kenyans could very easily do that for 487 families might be a help. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor David Dadason. Do you have any other question online? It seems as if you don't have any other question. So I'll be calling Professor Katumanga. No, I, I, was, I was to start with Dr. Biagon to address the, this question, followed by Professor Katumanga. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate the question that has been posed uh, to me from the floor and from online. I think I want to uh, make clear what the problem is that is, is I'm struggling with intellectually. And the issue is, uh, it's a fact there are people who, there are people who identify themselves as hustler. First of all, that was a bit, uh, it appeared to me to be a bit problematic, but there are people and it's not uh, one, it's a group of people. There are people who mobilized around around uh, on conversations around this election on this issue. The second part of, my, of, of, of what I'm observing is these people are drawing on certain cultural tropes, the idea of oppression, the idea of dispossession, you know, and they are making these links to this campaign word. So it is not, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about something which is not there. There are people who are, who are making this, this, uh, this, this argument that uh, we are consider ourselves this, you know, we, somebody uses a word like uh, Mimi Naona Nico included, Mambo ya hustlers. And they give certain narrations about their history. And these are connected to, to the theme that we had today of Mau Mau, the past and the events of the past and the class issue and the idea of dispossession. So there are these events. And one thing I should mention is in, in uh, these kind of groups, and, and there are several in South Sea and South B, these people are debating, they are engaging each other. They are engaging each other on, the, on these things. But when, when they speak to me, uh, when I engage um, uh, my main informant and the others, some things are clear. I am, I consider myself a hustler. I voted for William Ruto. We start from there. That's where our conversation starts. Why do, why do you call yourself this name? What is the importance of this? So at what point, and this is a critical question for me, at what point do slogans, words, and terminologies begin to gain cultural relevance? At what point do people begin to make connections between their past, between their, their traditions, between their histories and slogans that are given out there? What kind of connection, how do, we, how do people make these connections and therefore derive meaning out of these things we call slogans? I think intellectually, that's what I'm struggling with, you know, and that is what is driving me in these conversations. And so this also answers uh, my friend Benson Kanyinga's question of the idea that Gashagwa was saying we are children of Mau Mau just to get the votes. That may well be so, but what I'm saying is it appears that this kind of message was getting some kind of reception from a group of people, you know? And this uh, message had a deeper meaning than what we just think that, oh, we are uh, children of Mau Mau, we are the oppressed, uh, we are the ones who are marginalized, and therefore we, 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 we deserve to vote for William. But I think people who are making certain connections, people who are making certain deeper, uh, connections between these slogans and the stories that they have and the, the, the culture that they have come through. And I'm trying to understand how they were making these connections. That is really my main inter, inter, intellectual struggle in this issue. Louis White, to answer George Gona, Louis White, and in a, in a series of essay, 
talks specifically about rumors and gossip as as a, as, a, as a way of harvesting data that rumors and gossip, for example, in colonial Nairobi about vampires, about uh, things that were eating up people, were not just rumors, but there were ways in which the urban poor in Nairobi were constructing the colonial state. So if you want to dismiss rumors, I should uh, advise you to read Lewis White and that series of essays. And it, and it, it shows us how that uh, through this information of analyzing it and, and, and getting deeper into understanding it can help you see how social action eventually can be made out of this. Ah, ah, sorry, I forget, I forget that. Sorry, I forget that. So, yeah, so, uh, so my informants well, my interview was were debating this issue as I've, as I've mentioned before between themselves i have tried uh, as somebody who's close to these people to try to understand how they were constructing uh, this idea of hustler and how they were kind of appropriating it in order to make decisions so i think when i talk about debate i mean the environment in which I existed is where this issue was being was being questioned. People were exchanging ideas about, I am a hustler because of this, because of that. And they were raising uh, certain historical notions of dispossession and suffering and, and, and uh, the poor versus the rich and the, the colonial consensus, how some people came to power and others lost out. So there's a context in which this creation of the of meaning of hustler was happening in a debating environment. Okay. Uh, okay, Dr. Bogi would want to add on to that. So we give him that chance. Um, Elliot, I, I, I hear you. I, I, I hear you. But um, the question here is about methodology. And uh, I don't forget the fact that um, we, we are historians. And somebody has said that um, if historians are prophets, then they are prophets of the past. You see, you are dealing with a situation that is unfolding. You are dealing with a moving uh, target, uh, which uh, has not fully shown clear patterns uh, that uh, can sh uh, clearly, uh, you know, demonstrate resonance to certain historical situations. Of course, there are um, uh, things that you hear uh, as a historian, and you can link them uh, with the certain historical issues and debates and all that. But the, but the challenge we are having is. Um, you, you, you seem to tend more to uh, ethnography than uh, uh, history, because this is a question of methodology. It has nothing to do your, uh, with your content. It's, it's a question of methodology. And, and uh, the fact that we belong to the same community of people called historians, uh, and that's where the issue is coming from. And, and, and um, Loisa White's book on the vampires is based on uh, rumors of uh, ages back, where you see very clear patterns of how things were uh, unfolding in, in colonial uh, Nairobi. If um, Professor Musambai was dealing with that, uh, I wouldn't have this question that I'm having because uh, it comes from a completely different community uh, called political scientists. So, Gon and, uh, and Ken, uh, the issues you raised are basically connected. I totally agree with you. What I was simply trying to say is that beyond events and the structure, what uh, 
the history of geography here from a geopolitical point of view, basically six is to understand the aspects of continuity. That is one. But in addition to that, uh, those events as they happen, the issue is not so much as of trying to understand why X happened at that particular time, but to go in to try and look for a cyclic logic that seems to hold those dynamics essentially together. So for instance, one might want to understand why eight policemen died a week ago. But that's an event, very important. But for you to grasp that event, that's where you're trying to understand what is the fundamental connecting aspect. And you realize that you need an, about 100 or so years, 150 or so years to understand a very interesting dynamic, which also shapes a certain behavior pattern. Take an example of uh, the history of the suppression of the shift up process. And you'll hear stories about the role of uh, the special branch and the violence that indeed ended up mediating what you call a gala massacre and all that. So all those are events, but to understand this kind of a dynamic, we need to look at what the reason for state essentially is. Has it differed from what it was before? And if you look at what connectivities then do exist, you want to ask yourself whether in fact, this isn't some kind of a virus that, has, that holds together a framework and when you pursue that framework that much better, you realize that the aspect of the continuity is underpinned by certain dynamics. And those are the dynamics you want to look at. Now, if you take that as a starting point, uh, let, me, uh, let me first of all make a reference to the basis upon which we're constructing the termite movements. You have to go back to Mkandawire and you think about the termite economies. And so the aspect here is that they are feeding themselves and sustaining themselves within a certain specific geography. But what is the common denominator between termites, whether they're in Western or they're in, in, in the coast? It would be a function of what? The space within which they are operating. So what you're trying to ask yourself is that what are the dynamics over time in space that then mediate this continuous, what appears to be more or less like a, a aspects of groups stemming out each and every now and then in different geographies, when in fact, they are basically responding to the reason of a state. And that reason of a state is whether what we have here is not the continuity just of what that Frankensteinian infrastructure was, but probably a principality. In other words, whether it's Kenya or the rest of the African countries, whether we don't see a logic of a prince and a network of his enablers. And when you look at that kind of a state, a state in that kind of a sense, then you will tend to see that there's very little investment in transforming the very existence of what you call the population, which is very fundamental to what you call a state. In this case, you're talking about the ideas, the institutions, and how those ideas shape institutions that then provide the anchorage and the value in terms of what you're calling the physical base of a state, which is what the population, material resources that are existing, and the territory within which they're anchored. So if that investment is done there, if ideas are basically a mode of securitizing people, then a state is able to build up what in a Foucaultian sense you'd call the biopower of the state. And that biopower internally is able to allow it to project itself externally. But as it is right now, like all African states, that is the only way you can explain, for instance, the inability of say Mali to mobilize the population, all right? The, the leadership, that's what we meant by the trinity, the paradoxical trinity of the government of Mali, the people in Mali, and it's military to organize, to do what? To engender security. That failure then leads you to a situation where you have to outsource security. So if you outsource security, you go to ask yourself fundamentally whether you're actually a state and you understand the reason for existence as a state. So the totality of that is what would give you that kind of a sense of a memory, not necessarily shared, but to the extent to which you are within one space, you may want to presuppose the continuity of what you're calling distance decay brings about that aspect of convergence. Thank you. So uh, thanks so much, Professor Katumanga Musiabai for making us understand more on your work. So yes. 
So You are talking in tongues. <laughs> well, some of us are very ordinary people and we need to understand basically what is going on. You need to get out of the university and give us a little bit, um, speak in our language. Because I have one basic question. Um, again, it is related to what uh, uh, Eliud mentioned, his, his study and uh, the general relationship with the whole of this week in this department, what you've been going on through. Because Eliud's conclusion is giving me, I'm, I'm left with a question. Is Eliud saying that the common hustler in Nairobi or in Kenya, having understood the struggle for independence, having understood the ideals of the Mau Mau, can now say, I am being liberated. Is that what you're saying? And if that was he is saying, he's telling us that they are, they are young people, they are hustlers in this city who understand so well the, the Mau Mau struggle, the, the ideals of the struggle are now ready and they are going to be filled, filled in, in, the, in the hustler manifesto. I find that if that is the conclusion he's leading us to, I think it's a very dangerous thing because we are already dealing here with the question of what really, because the real question here we should be dealing with is after 70 years, is in this country still in a state of emergency where half a population cannot get food, where people are being still being killed. Why are we afraid to address these things in that, that angle? Where people are still disappearing. We are talking about mass graves. We are talking about mass killings. In Yalivaya, and this day, this day the, the, the dead are flowing. They are not even in, in rivers. We should be saying after 70 years, this country has not emerged from a state of emergency in people's lives. They are still living desperate lives that people in Central Province and part of other Kenya lived under the state of emergency under the Red Cross. It is not a question of Kikuyus here. It's not a question of whether it's Lu or whatever. It's not a question. The Mau Mau struggle is not Kikuyu. Let us move out of that. The issue of land is only that you must identify the spirituality of people. The Kikuyu spirituality is very identified with land. The Maasai spirituality is very identified with cattle, the nomads. So it goes around that. So let us look at this whole struggle for independence. Has it ceased? Has the struggle for life, has it ceased? Or are we still under the colonial dominance in the sense we are still under the state of emergency in our lives in this country? This is the question we should be dealing with in 70 years down the line. Is our state still a state that is a colonizing state in our lives? Is our state still a state of domination and control as the, the Dr. Ka, 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 Manga is trying to say, is it a state still fighting us to dominate the resources that we ourselves should have? Has that changed? Or is the struggle of the Mau Mau still on? Okay, okay, we hear you. I don't know whether Dr. Biagon, I'm going to give you only one minute, one minute press pod, only one minute. Yeah, with, uh, with all humility to our esteemed elder and uh, colleague Don't, uh, I think this, the, the debate is going on. And uh, there are groups who, to the best of their ability, in my, in my view, are talking about this issue and trying to make these connections and trying to make the connections between uh, these words that are given to them and what they know. So this, this, that engagement is going on. 
and uh, not one group, uh, but several, at least in the area where I, I, I live. And these groups talk about these issues. They may not have the depth that we who have studied history have and, and know about the, the Mau Mau fallout and the consensus that disfavored certain groups. They may not have these finer details, but I think from their conditions, the conditions of their own life, they are debating why they are poor and why certain families are very wealthy. So they are debating these things. And if you are able to gain uh, some of the confidence in some of them, they, they tell you what they talk about in, the, in these groups. So I think one uh, disadvantage that I suffer is I do not, uh, it's, it's a linguistic barrier. But another one I think is the methodological uh, issue where ethnography and, and, and uh, anthropologists, for example, deal with processes of society, whereas as historians, we are interested in processes of change. So I must say there is a terrain in which I am not methodologically very firm. However, what I can say is that these connections as to the conditions that these people find themselves in. And most of these people that I talk to are uh, the, the petty traders. They talk about the conditions they find themselves in and compare that with the amount of wealth that other people have. And they are raising questions about that. So this is certainly there. As to how to, appro how to analyze how they are making that connection, I think it's a space uh, where ethnographers would be more comfortable uh, but for us historians, I think making the link with our past, I think we can we can do that. So thank you very much for these uh, uh, conversations. I'm I'm very happy for the responses. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Eriod Diagon, for trying maybe to make your your work a little bit more clear to the audience. Now we have come to the end of our third session. So we want to take a break for only 10 seconds. We start, you start, you stretch, you stand up, you stretch and say hi to the person seated next to you. Say hi. Now, <laughs> now the break is over. So break time is over now. <laughs> so our, our break time is over. <laughs> so I want to hand over this mic to my colleague, uh, Mr. David Kule, who will be taking us through in our fourth session. So I thank you, I appreciate you for the time, for your patience. So we settle down, we settle down. Chair, we settle down so that we can start. We can start our fourth session. Dr. Gona, we settle down for our fourth session. Yo, saya breaki maisha imekuwa kidogo sana. I know that we are all very tired. We have been sitting here since morning. I want, I want to, I want to negotiate. I want to make an appeal so that, uh, so that whatever we come up with that appeal, the, the presenters are going to be very fast and conscious. And then we limit the questions to just about two, but we capture the point because of course it took time for those people uh, preparing to do so, so that they can be here today. We are going to have a slight change in the schedule because we have a request from Lab and Mushiri Kariti to be able to present first because he has a, a very urgent appointment to attend to. So without wasting a lot of time, I would like to welcome um, Laban to be able to come and talk to us about, uh, I don't know whether uh, the way he had presented it is like, uh, you know, debunking this myth that uh, uh, women did not participate in the Mau Mau. So I think uh, maybe he's going to expand our knowledge base on uh, the role of women in the Mau Mau. Uh, I would like to greet you all, Hamjambo. You good? Uh, thank you for this opportunity. I am Laban Karithi from St. Paul's University. 
uh, Faculty of Theology. My paper today, I'm going to speak about the role of women in the Mau Mau and because of the little schedule and the time that we have, I'm going directly into the paper. I'll begin my paper with a question. How comes the law of women in Mau Mau uprising is not discussed as much as the role of male, the male counterparts? Uh, within the forest with men braving the cold and the risk of being attacked and killed by either the wild animals or the British bombs? Were they at home taking care of families and the, as their husbands fought in the forest? As you're going to find out, women played a vital role during the fight of the independence as we are going to see exactly what they did. The Mau Mau movement in Kenya was a resistant movement against the British colonial rule. It involved rebels who took up arms against the British in the attempt to drive them out of Kenya. The British responded with a brutal counter-insurgency campaign that killed thousands of Mau Mau fighters and civilians. Men largely led this movement. However, women played a vital role in the movement, despite most of them being at the forefront of the battle. The extent of the women's involvement significantly centered out the myth that two men in the colonial societies were passive, submissive, and docile. This involvement entailed participation in the fighting as communicators, producers of food, and uh, pro producers and food providers, propaganda tools, and caregivers. When we say about the women in the Mau Mau, the movement that was started in 1950s to protest British colonial rule, women were active participant and the involvement was crucial to the success of this movement. Women were specifically targeted by the British colonial government as it was believed that they were the main drivers of Mau Mau's support. The British carried out a campaign of sexual violence and intimidation against Mau Mau women in an attempt to discourage them from participating in the movement. This campaign included rape, forced sterilization, and public executions. Despite the dangers, our women uh, continued to support the Mau Mau. They provided food and shelter for fighters and acted as spies and messengers. They also took up arms. Uh, they also took up arms themselves and fought alongside the men. The Mau Mau would not have been successful without the involvement of women. Their courage and de dedication in the face of immense odds is an inspiration to all who fought for freedom. Uh, on the literature, literature review and the methodology, I've uh, focused on the works by Prissy in 2019, Kikuyu Women and the Mau Mau Rebellion and the Social Change in Kenya and also works of Derito 2019 about Mukami Kimanthi, Mau Mau woman freedom fighter, Mahalo bridging uh, divides. Uh, this is what women did as fighters. Despite the patriarchal constraint that make it challenging to gather enough information regarding the female Mau Mau fighters, specific findings illustrate how women took part in the actual fighting. For instance, when General Kubukubu was ambushed and killed by colonizers in Kianjokoma, Embu, he died alongside his woman, Combat. Another example of women, uh, women's involvement in fighting was the attack of the police officer who arrested Harry Thuku by a woman, which led the fears and the colonial reaction among them, demonstration in which other women participated fully. Women as producers and providers of food during the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya, they played this role as producers and providers of food with their husband away fighting. Women had to run to the farm and feed their family. This was not an easy task. They had to contend with the British colonial forces determined to crush the liberian. Uh, the Rito in his book, he details the experiences of Mokami Kemathi, a woman, a brave woman and wife to Dedan Kemathi shows how women played their role well in supporting their families and fighters. The author asserts that women often had to hide food and supplies from the British and sometimes had to defend their homes from attack. The women's role was to ensure their fighters were fully supplied with foodstuffs while fighting in the British soldiers in the forest. 
Despite the difficult condition, women managed to keep their families fed and supplied throughout their pricing. Another example of a woman who played this role well during their pricing is Wanjiro Nyamaruto, a hardcore rebel, uh, widely respected by all rebels. This woman led food distribution for the fighters and gathered intelligence data. Most historians argue that she helped the male warrior uh, and their predominantly patriarchal society change their perception of women's role in the revolutionary movement. As communicators, during the Maumau uprising in Kenya, women played this vital role. In, in her book, Presley in 2019, argues that women provided male and female fighters with crucial battlefield information. They acted uh, as liaisons between the Maumau fighters and the forest of the villages passing on information about British troop movement and supplies. The women often carried messages hidden in their clothing or secret compartment in their homes. This allowed the Maumau to coordinate the activities and stay one step ahead of the British colonial authorities. The women primarily played this role since the colonialists were less likely to target or kill them. The role of women as communicators during this uh, Maumau uprising was essential to the success of the rebel groups. Without their help, the Maumau would have struggled to coordinate the activities and communicate with uh, the outside world. As caregivers and healers, theological views of the role of women vary, but many believe that women are called to be caregivers, caretakers, and healers. This is certainly true of the women who played the role in the Maumau uprising. Uh, they played this role uh, for caring for the wounded and sick and providing emotional support for the fighters. The Maumau uprising was bloody conflict that lasted for over eight years. During this time, thousands of people were killed and many were displaced. In the book, The Brutal End of the Empire Kenya by Caroline Elkins argues that women were often the ones who bore out the band of the violence resulting from the Maumau uprising. They were the ones who had to care for the wounded and sick, as well as the children who were left orphaned. The role of women as caregivers and healers during the Maumau uprising was crucial. Without their help, the death toll would have been much higher. So women also played this role in providing emotional support for the fighters. They helped them to keep their morale high and give them the strength to continue fighting. As propaganda tools, the women played this role uh, by acting as messengers and spreading the world about the Maumau's objective and activities. These propaganda roles included ritualistic activities, which included singing war songs, chanting and dancing to raise the fighters' morale, and enhance sense of unity. Other women uh, performed divination, such as um, Barungu. Uh, Barungu actually had to sacrifice the, his own son in order to uh, prevent uh, famine during the Maumau uprising. And other prominent female diviners who performed various rituals for the fighters. And the British government later imprisoned Barungu in 1950 due to her involvement in the war. And with the continuity of the involvement of uh, the role of women, even after Kenya gained independence, we find that women continue to play various laws in public life and politics. Although they have not yet attained participation equivalent to that of men, for instance, women's involvement in religious activity increased after colonization. This change resulted from the action of Christian missionaries who established schools and churches with educated women and offered them uh, and offered them a convenient platform to express their religious beliefs. Today, some women have established their own churches, allowing them to control the narrative and theology of their congregation. In addition to the churches, uh, Guio 2017 indicates that women participate in missionary work to spread the gospel and the Christianity, which is an active role opposite to the thinking that women are submissive and docile. Other women have started educational institutions and seminaries to train next generation of Christians, like the increasing women involvement in religious activity. This gender continues to improve their active political participation. And, uh, and we find that women serve in elective positions in Kenya, registrature, and other executive function. 
However, their involvement is yet to achieve equal participation in political and religious affairs like men. And as I conclude, the role of women during Maumau uprising in Kenya was crucial in the fight for Kenya's independence. Women were at the forefront of the Maumau movement and their participation was essential in the success of the uprising. As explained above, their role included communication, provision of food, propaganda tools, fighting and giving care. Women's involvement in Maumau uprising showed that they were capable of leading a revolution and fighting uh, for their country's independence. Thank you so much. Thank Sana Laban for that. I'd, I'd like to, for the sake of time, I'd like to ask Justice to just come and comment on uh, Laban's uh, contribution just for two minutes, please, Justice. Just as I may disappear. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you very much, uh, the school of Laban, uh, for that wonderful presentation. I'll be very brief indeed um, and say the following uh, Yes, Laban, we agree uh, with your work in most cases. But to me, what you are saying is rather obvious. Yeah, it has been done elsewhere. And there are so many studies on that. In fact, we have not had really your point of departure from what we know. We are looking forward, for example, you coming from a theological background, maybe you tell us how they are chanting, how they are songs, how they are prayers, has have influenced theology to date. But just mentioning the encouragement, spies, providing food, this has been done over and over again. And if you read uh, many of those literatures, you'll be able uh, to see them. So we are saying uh, it's a good presentation, but then you should be able to move and find out what is new. For example, we're asking you, what is new in your study, right? What is new in your study that we have not heard before, right? All that you have said, we have heard about it before. We know women, for example, in the rural areas continued to make change. In fact, most of the changes in the rural areas is based on women, isn't it? So what is new that are telling us, maybe you link Mau Mau to theology now, and then we see what is new that you're telling us, perhaps their prayers, their chanting, how has it influenced uh, issues like Mongiki, the tent, and so on and so forth. So we want you to broaden your understanding. Thank you very much. Asan Sana and Wadi Muhabat. Do we have a question from the audience or from online? Okay, go ahead, sir. I, I just want to bring out one point about women participation in the war. It is actually the woman who caused a total change of strategy by the colonial military in fighting the war. The reason for putting us in concentration camps is when they realized they cannot hope to win this war with the woman moving freely. They were actually detaining the woman when they came up with a concentration camp. It is summarized that strategy and the reason for it is summarized in a song we used to sing, especially by our mothers. Mulugwa menyire nangoro, bare nueto ilionea tumia, na iretu mageke rainya, nazika utichia tohe. 
That means the white man or the colonialist has realized that this war cannot be won or it is sustained by the woman, the girl, and the boy scouts. Very little is known about the what the five to 12 year old boys did for the, for the fighters. The women, like my mother, were known to have taken oaths, so the Muzungu was very careful about them. The girls were sent to get secrets out of the home guards and, 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 and the administrators. And the boys who would be out there in the field looking after goats and cows and had to be home or rather in the concentration camp by 6 p.m. had ways of actually breaking the curfew and the communicating messages from their mothers to soldiers. I remember my brother being arrested at age nine for being out after 6 p.m. And my mother had to mobilize women to get him released by the chief. That song I've sung talks of why the, the war strategy was changed. The, the colonial military thought detaining our fathers and the others are in forests. Those are the two they are fighting. And they realize, no, this is a whole community. All the community are soldiers. And the only way to cut some communication lines or to try and minimize effectiveness of that sustenance is to detain the whole community. That's, uh, that's a new one on me. So <laughs> that's, we appreciate new information. So Asante Sana. Uh, do we have uh, uh, just one more question from either the physical audience or the online audience? Just one question for Laban. If we don't, then I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Umbongi to come and talk to us about the pen that was mightier than the sword. And of course, uh, I don't think uh, we, we, we need to introduce uh, Malimu again. We have introduced him so many times today. <laughs> Karibu Malimu. And please, if you are still here, you're um, going to be discussing, yeah. You know, friends, when I look at your faces, uh, they suggest that uh, if I take the 30 minutes that I'm meant to take, uh, then uh, you, you will stage a mau mau against me. That is partially why I have returned my laptop, uh, which has this paper, which is only 43 pages. Um, so what I want to do is uh, just to give you the summary of the summary of this paper. Uh, I wanted to talk to you on the subject uh, that I've entitled, um, the pen was mightier than the sword, Mau Mau in the academy. Um, what what um, uh, I'm trying to do here is um, an, an attempt at examining um, academic politics and uh, production of knowledge as seen through the lenses of a very uh, emotional movement uh, that we call uh, uh, the Mau Mau. And uh, I interface this with the developments in the Department of History and Archaeology, uh, which has invited us uh, 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 here. And uh, I do this with the hope that um, 
I, I intend to propose a, a way out of um, the, the preoccupation with controversies and quarrels and fights, uh, you, you know, and uh, uh, very broad manifestations of um, innate instincts of emotion uh, that have been witnessed in the understanding of, 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 of Mau Mau by suggesting something that we all agree that um, the Mau Mau movement is uh, an omnibus uh, uh, movement. Uh, the, the word omnibus that I put in this uh, 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 overall title for this subsection uh, simply means um, it is an old English word which uh, meant an old uh, uh, car that was pulled by horses. That's before the motor car was invented and, and then carry everybody from uh, 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 the places and transport them and the horses would uh, uh, pull uh, this car, the omnibus. So I um, uh, see Mau Mau and, and this is something that has come out of the discussions we have had as uh, an omnibus, very big, very complex, uh, uh, to, to be able to be uh, understood uh, through a, a single uh, story, uh, you, you know. Now, to do that, I, I wanted to briefly give you the history of the origins and development of the Department of History and Archaeology, and then uh, delve into a few contradictions uh, that have emerged within that department in relation to the study of uh, Mau Mau, uh, and then briefly talk about the way out. Uh, to begin, the first one, um, the Department of History and Archaeology uh, was actually founded uh, in 1956 as a part of the Royal uh, Technical College, and it was among the four uh, uh, departments that constituted the then uh, Faculty of Arts. Uh, at the time, uh, of course, you uh, understand that the kind of education the colonial government wanted to give uh, to, to this first multiracial college to be established in Nairobi was basically rudimentary. If, if uh, you read the colon, uh, colonial report that recommended the, uh, the, 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 the construction of uh, such a colleges uh, within its colonies in Africa was to uh, recognize the fact that uh, the way things looked uh, from the 1940s to the 1950s is that uh, these people will finally uh, be independent. And we want to leave these colonies on the hands of uh, 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 people who will take care of our, our interests. And so start giving incrementally some tertiary education. That's a context uh, that led to the uh, emergency of the Royal Technical College. Uh, which would become uh, the University of Nairobi in, uh, in 1970. Uh, but uh, in those early years, uh, between 1956 and 1964, uh, 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 the, the department had two uh, chairmen, uh, uh, both of them uh, 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 Europeans. And uh, the first African to work uh, in this department uh, was uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Njuguna Karanja, who could uh, later become uh, the vice president of, uh, of, 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 of the country. That was the first African uh, to, to uh, work in this department. And then later on, he was followed by uh, Professor Betuel Alan Ogot when he relocated from uh, Makerele to, to join Nairobi in 1964. And later on, he could actually become the chairman of this department in uh, uh, 1966. Now, with um, the, the, the coming of uh, uh, Bio God, they shifted, there was a move of Kenyans from Makerele. Most of them moved. Uh, uh, Professor Wasawa, Professor Minde. Uh, Professor Wasawa was actually the principal uh, of, of, of Makarele College at some stage. So they all moved uh, because of uh, a few rankles over there, which I don't want to uh, get into. Now, uh, when Ogot becomes uh, 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 the chair of department, 
uh, things begin to happen that were deliberately aimed, not just at uh, Africanizing uh, the, 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 the department in terms of staff, uh, but also in terms of the syllabus of, uh, of, 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 of history. Uh, and this is where uh, things uh, uh, began. And um, Ogot belonged to um, a, a, a historical tradition that strongly believed uh, uh, that Africa had a history uh, before uh, colonialism. And this is something that was uh, very strongly repudiated by uh, the colonial historians. Uh, in, in fact, the story of Professor Robert Troffa is very well known, uh, who once uh, said, and I quote, that perhaps in the future, uh, uh, there will be a, a, a history of Africa to teach. Uh, what is there now is a history of European explorers European administrators and European missionaries, and the rest is darkness, and darkness is not a subject of history. Uh, oh God comes from the tradition that, uh, and, and the reason why colonial historians were convinced that there is no history to write in Africa was because of lack of written documents. Uh, basically. So uh, they did not think that oral traditions will actually enable one to reconstruct uh, the history of uh, pre-colonial Africa. Uh, Ogot turned that around with a lot of support uh, by uh, Olfa Roland uh, uh, in, in the University of London, and he became the first person to write uh, 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 the, the history of pre-colonial uh, uh, Africa in Kenya, based uh, 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 overwhelmingly on oral uh, traditions. So for God then, Africanizing uh, the syllabus uh, in Nairobi uh, meant uh, actually adding the content that emphasized uh, uh, pre-colonial Africa, that we had institutions, we had structures, uh, we had this glorious uh, past uh, before colonialism interrupted us. He took a very strongly nationalistic uh, approach uh, to the study of colonial Africa in order to prove that we had a history. And, and then he ended up, of course, uh, uh, producing a lentinue of students, uh, both within the department and also those he sent to, uh, 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 to London, uh, including uh, uh, William Ocheng, uh, who we all know, uh, Mwansi, Henry Mwansi, uh, who could also write the history of uh, the Cape Sigis, Ocheng wrote the history of the, the Gusi, and, and many others. Uh, this is a story we know. Uh, but fast forward, um, there the, 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 the were two strands of the understanding of nationalist history uh, within the history department. There was this strand of a God, which of emphasized uh, pre-colonial uh, Africa, and there was a strand of uh, uh, much younger uh, uh, historians than Ogot, uh, who were strongly supported by colleagues from the Department of Literature, especially uh, uh, Professor Ngui Wadiongo, who saw nationalism par excellence in Kenya uh, through the Mau Mau uh, movement. And they mainly saw Mau Mau uh, within uh, a fairly narrow binary of uh, 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 traitors and uh, fighters who went to the forest, uh, what you call uh, home guards who betrayed everybody, and uh, the fighters, the gallant uh, soldiers who went to the forest and paid the ultimate price uh, to, uh, to liberate the, uh, the country. Ogot was very strongly against that approach. He not only termed it as a narrow, uh, but also uh, in his view, uh, it exuded with a lot of ethnic Jehovahism. In fact, in a paper that he, 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 he presented in 1981 at the Kenya Historical Association Conference, he dismissed uh, the likes of uh, Maena Wakinyati then and uh, for their narrow approach, and then glorified uh, some young scholars who were using the Marxist uh, 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 approach in the interpretation and understanding of, of Mao Mao. That is where uh, problems uh, began. The 
uh, the contestations between uh, these two understanding of uh, the nationalist approach uh, to the writing of uh, uh, the history of Mau Mau created uh, uh, quite a lot of problems in summary in the department and it divided people into two. And um, uh, later on, we have another school that emerges that was more inclined to the socialist interpretation of, uh, of, of, of Mau Mau, which oh God also did not uh, have time for, uh, the likes of, uh, of, of Odien Odiambo. And this culminated in the Kenya Historical Association meeting of 1986 uh, uh, that actually could prove uh, uh, to be the last straw in the Camelos back. And, and after that, the differences in the department were such that um, uh, 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 some people would not see uh, eye to eye, partially uh, because of those ideological differences. Uh, some inclined to thinking of ethnicity and, uh, uh, and nepotism. In fact, uh, the transition uh, from Mogot uh, uh, to, to, to Professor Murioki as uh, the chair of the Department of History, uh, although uh, 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 it's not very loudly said, uh, if you read Ogot's autobiography, it, it was fairly acrimonious because Ogot felt that um, Gideon Were. Uh, then who was an associate professor was more qualified uh, than uh, uh, the man who nudged uh, some of us who were younger, Professor Murioki, uh, uh, to be the chair of, of, of the department. And uh, actually uh, that uh, marked the most active part of the historical association uh, of Kenya. And then uh, uh, it, 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 it began to end gradually and led to what we sometimes loosely call the exodus of quote unquote the gurus, the original gurus of historical discourse in the department uh, to Kenyatta University, uh, which was uh, uh, a daughter of uh, the Department of History. My very good friend Elliot talked about we are sister departments, uh, but I just wanted to tell you that um, uh, however old a daughter is, uh, she cannot be older than the mother. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, the, with the exit of these, uh, uh, these gurus, actually, it marked more or less the end of uh, the Historical Association of Kenya. And our efforts to revive it uh, has been uh, uh, generally uh, very, uh, very difficult. So we are talking about a nationalist uh, historiography. And I'm just about to finish uh, that um, was not very nationalizing. It was more uh, 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 of a, a situation that created oppression, created the confrontation, and uh, a little bit of misunderstanding among the historians in, in the department. In, in a sense, therefore, uh, we, we, we see uh, a situation emerging where Mau Mau becomes a point of uh, uh, quarrel. Uh, that beats one group of historian uh, uh, with the other within the department of history. And what emerges is um, a narrative that is full of dialectics of, um, on one side, suppression of the truth of what Mau Mau was or, or, or cover up. And, and it created a number of groups uh, uh, that emerged, of course, uh, bringing in even the veterans uh, who thought that uh, historians were not doing uh, a lot of justice to, 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 to the writing of uh, the history of, uh, of, of, of Mau Mau. So on one side, you have a group uh, which uh, was more or less pro the Kenyan establishment then, who said, we know enough about Mau Mau, and then Mau Mau is our heritage, things happened, we need to do what? We need to move on. There's another group which says, no, 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 we don't know much. The historians have done the service to us, so we will come and uh, uh, do it ourselves. Professor Wahoma talked about a group that was here. I, I was already uh, here, uh, who came and said, we will now want to uh, write uh, uh, our history uh, because you have uh, uh, failed us. So what am I saying, friends? 
is that what I'm saying is that uh, the study of Mao Mao, even within uh, uh, the, 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 the narrow corridors of the Department of History and Archaeology here in the university, has been very controversial. And from the discussions that we had yesterday, I have a feeling that uh, that controversy uh, still continues. And it is not uh, 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 going to stop. Uh, very, very soon. And I cannot delve beyond that because I'm a, I'm a historian. So the question I ask is, what is the way out? And, and I'm concluding now. I want to suggest that um, there's one thing that is very clear when you study uh, the, the, the history of the history department, that what paracanized the understanding of, uh, of, of, of Mao Mao uh, is actually an exercise of some kind of political uh, uh, enterprise in um, uh, the production of, 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 of knowledge. And therefore, I suggest that uh, one way to sort out these uh, challenges is to accept uh, an obvious reality that Mao Mao is a very omnibus uh, 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 movement. Uh, very big, very complex, uh, a clauses that cannot be understood uh, with a single story. Uh, uh, Dr. Gache talked about this uh, uh, the other day. So which way to go in, in summary? I am with a, few, a view that um, th th there is a way in which uh, uh, Mao Mao to me is a single uh, movement uh, made up of several strands. Uh, uh, that have been created or will be created by historians because we continue to uh, study uh, uh, this movement. The one very interesting thing is uh, that um, uh, th these strands that constitutes this omnibus uh, movement uh, are actually in a constant contestation uh, in, in what I see as uh, contending hegemonies. And, and, and I'm using the word hegemony in the sense of, uh, for those of us who have read Antonio, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian philosopher, uh, his book, uh, the, the Prison Notes, uh, where he, he talks about um, the, the social hegemony, which is a product of a dominant uh, narrative, uh, which is bound to create uh, hierarchies of, of power in uh, the understanding of any historical uh, uh, phenomenon. And, and therefore, I will end by saying that the best then thing to approach uh, the, 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 the study of, of, of Mao Mao is to go the direction of contending hegemonies, strands that are in constant contestation uh, and seeking uh, to produce a dominant uh, narrative that will carry uh, uh, the day. And um, I, I get a lot of inspiration from uh, uh, this because uh, if, if you read uh, the, the, the study uh, of uh, the Indian national movement, for example, and the subaltern approach, uh, uh, literally trying to uh, 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 go beyond the big man uh, 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 syndrome that we have in historical analysis, uh, the contending hegemonies have provided a way of understanding the Indian national movement in ways that have minimized the kind of challenges and quarrels that we have had here. And therefore, friends, uh, Mau Mau is an omnibus. It cannot be understood by a single story because it's made of uh, uh, strands that speak very well to contending hegemonies, uh, which can only be understood by multiple stories. Thank you. So it's, it's getting late very, very fast. So we are going to have to go fast as well. And I think uh, one way of achieving that is to just have uh, the next speaker follow up on Mwali Mwambongi's uh, 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 talk. And then uh, after that, we are going to open questions for all of us at the same time. So <clears throat> if that's agreeable, I'd like to call upon Julius. Julius Mwindi, I think he's going to be presenting uh, offline. Is that correct? 
Oh, yes, uh, Julius here. This is Julius Moindi. Can I proceed if uh, you can hear me? Going to talk to us about broadening the geographical coverage of the Mau Mau. And uh, Julius is a founder and director of the Akamba Cultural Museum. That one is in Makweni County. He has uh, done uh, quite a number of uh, field research work on uh, Mau Mau sites. And he's, talking, he's going to talk to us about um, some of that research includes recordings and taking pictures and so on, and also listening. Um, he's going to talk about uh, partly origins of the word or the acronym Mau Mau, or what it means. Mau Mau sites in Ukambani, the authing process, reasons for authing, and I think other, other tragedies like the castration process and so on at uh, the things that we were told were taking place in uh, at the river by Margaret in the morning. Karibu sana, uh, Julius. Thank you so much, um, David. I am really honored to address this international conference. And uh, colleagues, get ready to hear from a layman because uh, I will not be quoting uh, scholars. What I will be doing is um, what I have been able to research on as I went face to face to these uh, people who suffered from uh, Mau Mau and uh, to the various sites. Uh, I believe one, I sought to understand what does the name Mau Mau mean? Because I thought it should be an acronym, should be something like that. But uh, the story I got from uh, the horror stories was that um, it was associated with uh, Muindi Mbengu. And that was earlier than 1952 in that um, when they led the process from Matungulu and Kangundo, when he met the governor, he was asked, uh, what do you want done so that uh, you feel contented? And they said in the local language, tuenda kwe kalata maun maitu tuwe vye ngombe. Ta maun maun maitu. Nundu ndenu ni ya maun maun maitu. So maybe because of the language, then the white man thought uh, to summarize it, maun maun. At least that is one threat I got about the origin of the name Mau Mau, because it is not a name of a place, it's not somebody's name. So I really wanted to understand where did this name come from? And then from 1938, of course, Mundibengo was accused of belonging or leading the report uh, called Mau Mau. And in 1953, of course, we all know he was uh, brutally murdered. I don't know by who's who suspected he was working with the whites or the whites themselves, the colonial masters. So that was a little bit of a delving into the name Mau Mau. Now, to broaden the geographical coverage, uh, the county government of Makweni, um, the, the former government, now we have a new one, they wanted to map sites with the historical value, heritage sites, and the places of natural beauty. And uh, that is where I came in with the Makwene team. We went around the county trying to map these places. And of particular interest were sites that were used by Mau Mau as authing sites. And uh, the greatest challenge we got during this uh, research was that uh, the horse is binding for life. And the majority of those people we were referred to did not want to talk. And even after we requested them to, to deactivate the oath, because in Cumberland, if you want to deactivate the oath, you just apply saliva on your finger, then touch the soil and then lick again. And, the horse will lose power, but uh, they did that, but still they did not want to really speak about Mau Mau. They were skeptical, they were fearful. 
they thought, uh, of course, revealing that uh, they will die. So some of these sites, are um, the Mutuambo rock, this rock is near a town called Kasikeo. And this is a rock where those to be oathed were assembled for initial instructions. And these assemblies took place at night, after which then they were escorted to another place called Kwangombe. Now, Kwangombe is a place that we found where uh, they would now move to stage two. And then they move, uh, sorry, Kwangombe, there were seven huts where one would go through. They could not tell us what exactly was in the seven huts and or what was said in those seven huts. Then people would be moved to Kwakavi caves. All these places have been documented. We have taken their GPS because the county wants to use them as part of history of the Kamba people, as part of history of the Mau Mau to tell the story to the world because it's all our heritage. So this was the final place. Um, then the elders would be inside the caves. They would be giving knowledge and the caves would be used to instill courage into those who were being hosted. Even today, there is a school called Kethitoni Secondary in uh, near that place. And Kethitu, of course, is the Kamba word for oath. Now that is to mean geographically, then the Mau Mau was very active in Kambaland and this and other places in the country. So it was not only restrained to one place, but uh, it was, we can say all over the country. And uh, for my study, my research, I was basing it in uh, Cumberland. Then there is another place called Mukame Wambeu. Mukame Wambeu, there is a very holy tree, which is called Mukame. So the place is called Mukame Wambeu near Kekumene. There is a, a Mau Mau detention camp. I visited the area. There are remnants of wars. There are, rem there are beds, there are scattered household items. There are some bits of chains and all that. And uh, the area is said to be hounded by the spirits of the people who were tortured and killed in that area. We were told as late as 1990s, there was a hand that was sticking from the soil, meaning somebody was buried there or many people were buried there, but uh, later on the hand disappeared. The hand was raised up as if to call for assistance, but uh, it later became a skeleton. And so this is to show you that um, a lot of Kamba people also bore the brand of Mau Mau. We had people were killed, people got lost and all that. Now, then you can see a picture there below is uh, the Mutuambo rock. On the edge of the rock, there's a small pool. And we were told that um, here, there is a book that was being sought by the colonial masters. And this book had listed people who had taken the horse because they used to write down the names. So when the keeper, the record keeper heard that uh, the, the, the white man was coming for him and they knew of course there'll be torture, there'll be everything and many people will suffer. He dipped the book in water and he shredded it so that nobody could read out the names. But of course he was betrayed by the spies for the colonial master, that is the, like the home guards, he was arrested, he was tortured he, until he died, but um, he never gave out a single name. But uh, we heard stories that uh, there is a copy because there were two lists, the list for the assembling in Mutuambo Rock, and then the list when you came out after you were oathed. So we are still hot in pursuit to know whether that list can be from that list, then we will know who actually was involved because majority, when they were discovered, they either disappeared or they were tortured to death. But many of them, like from my village, we have three people who have disappeared and nobody, they were arrested and nobody up to today knows where they are. And uh, people are still wondering, people have never brought a closure to what happened to their people. And I've had it said here, yeah, I wish this could happen because there are many families suffering who want to bring a closure. So the whole thing process, for, so the whole thing we were told was binding till death. 
and men would be collected by sentries at night and herded to a rock where they would be briefed on the process. They would then be listed and moved silently at night to the Othing Caves, as I mentioned before. And the major question asked in the local language Kikamba was, the question was, are you ready for what we want to do to drive the white man out of our country, Kenya? Now, if you respond yes, then the ceremony continued. And we are told if you said no, then you would be acted to death on the spot. So the killings were on both sides. These guys who were administering the oath were merciless. If you refuse, then they get you killed. So the oath was administered using a goat taken from the heart of one who was being hosted. So they would come secretly to your home, then grab a goat. You will only see it the, 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 that time you are being hosted. And then they give you a knife to cut the head. You cut your own goat, which was taken without your consent. Now that brutality, of course, meant that uh, it was to harden you. So the blood and the stomach contents, as is common in various oaths, in, um, in Ukambani, then was mixed. The, the, this guy told us there was another blood that these guys had, which they don't know where it came from. And it was from, was it animal blood or what was it? So this they could not tell us because they were still under oath. So we asked them, why did you then have to take the oath? So it was to bind people to the cause. It was to prevent disasters because the task ahead was really difficult and then to keep secrets on what was done during the struggle forever. So we've tried to make this guy, I don't know what method we will use, but one guy has promised me when he feels that he's about to die, he will send for me if I will be alive. And then I, he can now tell me the things that he has refused to tell me, which is of course might be very good for our history. So in that picture, you can see one of the guys uh, I interviewed is called Kenyele Ngovi, is from Kasikeu. Then on the right, you can see two women whose husbands disappeared during that time. And uh, they, perceived, they assumed they were part of the Mau Mau, they were taken. Uh, the first lady here says she heard that her husband was spotted in Manyani. Later on, she doesn't know what happened. The other one says she had her husband was seen somewhere in the river, uh, having some cattle, but uh, up to today, she does not know what really happened to her husband. There's a short clip here. I don't know whether it will play. I don't know, is the clip playing? Because I can't see it here. Okay, it is, it's on. Yeah, sorry for that uh, horrible clip. I recorded quite a number of uh, videos during the interviews and you can see basically he's saying that um, the preferred method of torture was a castration and uh, they would tie a 14 kilogram stone on one's genitals, then they whip you to stand. When you stand, then the genitals will be crushed and you are hands castrated. So it was very painful. The pain would last for days, for weeks. And this is what our people went through and which uh, we, we really, do not want to forget. And that's why we need to write uh, this uh, history. Uh, in conclusion, that, that, that um, you know, the Akamba people say that so we don't need a lot of uh, uh, medicine that is curative. I am finishing in an, an orthodox style by asking these questions. The Mau Mau came as a response to the colonial master's oppression. What was the objective of the oppressor? Did the oppressor achieve his objectives or he still pursues the objectives to date? Did the Mau Mau achieve their goal or they were tortured and killed in vain? Do we as a country recognize and honor them or we are like the proverbial medicine man 
who was known all over, but not recognized in his village. Now that it is known there was human abuses committed during the crackdown, are reparations possible? Of course, I know there is public compensation we have had. Or can we start the process now after this conference? Because this is something that is bitter in everybody's heart and we need to bring a closure to this. So thank you so much for the opportunity to listen to a layman who did not quote any scholar. Thank you so much, David. Sandy Sana, Sandy Sana, Julius, thank you so much. That's, that's definitely a new way of looking at it. Uh, you know, uh, the process, especially nobody uh, talked about really how it happened, even though we have had an idea of what might have happened, but talking about the tiny nitty gritties about how it actually happened and also uh, increasing the scope. Perhaps what you need is to come up with an atlas of Mau Mau site. Maybe that is something the department can think about. We have one more paper to go by Joy. I think Joy is also going to be virtual. Joy Nyokavi is going to talk about uh, the, with, the withholding of the migrated archives that have been mentioned more than 14 times within the last three days in this conference. She's going to give us a few more uh, perspectives about this. And uh, our discussion is going to be Pamela, who is ready for that. So Joy, if you are ready, uh, go. Yes. Yes, just a second. Let me share my screen. All right, um, I think you can see my screen now. Okay, <clears throat> um, first of all, I just want to thank you all so much for being here today um, in this historic moment. And thank you for um, staying on. I know it's a bit late um, to listen to our presentations. So my name is John Nyokabi. I'm doing my master's in Pan-African studies at Syracuse University. Um, and I'm here to present to you a project that I'm working on for my thesis. It's um, a project that is still ongoing. Um, and it's about um, denying Kenyans access to their history. And it re this relates to Britain's withholding of Kenya's migrated archive and the hand slope disclosure. So I'm just going to go through my introduction, um, literature review, methodology findings, and finally talk about some um, discussions. And so um, briefly to go through the background of the study, um, for the Mau Mau case of, um, sorry about that, Mau Mau case of um, reparations, we know that um, thousands of Kenyan nationals were subjected to torture and other forms of ill treatment at the hands of the British colonial administration during the Kenyan emergency in the 1950s. We know that these detainees were subject to arbitrary killings, severe physical assaults, and extreme acts of inhuman and degrading treatment. In 2009, Lee Day Law Firm issued a claim for compensation of the British High Court for alleged torture against the British government on behalf of five elderly Kenyans who had been detained and tortured by the British colonial administration. In response to these claims, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, as a named defendant for the British government, sought to strike out the case. However, the judge presiding in the High Court ruled in favor of the claimants. And so we saw um, you know, revisionist historians coming in um, to buttress the case for Mau Mau in this um, case. Um, we had expert witnesses such as David Anderson, Carolyn Elkins, and Hugh Bennett, um, who were called in as expert witnesses. And in the case of David Anderson, he filed a witness statement setting out evidence that the British administration in Kenya 
took steps before December in 1963 to remove the UK records relating to the administration of the Mau Mau emergency so that this would not be among the records handed over to the incoming independent Kenyan government. Soon after that, thousands of documents were discovered at Hanslow Park. This is what we know today as the Hanslow Disclosure. And this document showed the full scale of abuse against detainees and the paper trail went all the way up to the colonial secretary. The documents retrieved from the Hanslope disclosure were later deposited at the National Archives in Kew, London, and came to be known as the Foreign and Commonwealth Office Files 141 or the FCO 141 files. And so for my research questions, I am looking at the central question of access. So to whom were the migrated archives given access to after the Hanslope disclosure? What does having access or inaccess to these migrated archives really mean for Kenyans and for ordinary Kenyans? And in what ways does Britain's withholding of Kenya's migrated archive relate to the broader discourse of neocolonialism? And so worth mentioning is that the theoretical framework through which I'm looking at this topic of the migrated archives is through neocolonialism neo and decolonization. And so you know, looking at the case of um, the migrated archives and how they connect to the broader issue um, of neocolonialism um, between Kenya and its former colonial master, Britain. For my literary view, I examined um, a few books and articles, notably um, Imperial Reckoning by Caroline Elkins and History of the Hanged um, by David Anderson. And so in her book, Elkin talks about the Mau Mau civilian war that was exerted on majority Kikuyu settlements, leading to our systemic pipeline of violence through detention, screening, and villagization. She also provides graphic accounts of torture, rape, castration, and murder, together with the role of the colonial state in the execution of systematic violence. David Anderson, on the other hand, covers the forest war or the war between Mau Mau soldiers the British army and the colonial police. In his research, he notes um, large gaps in records at the Kenya National Archives. He also discovered documents in Nairobi indicating crates of papers had been moved to London in 1963. Documents also indicated that this um, documents had been received in London. And in Nairobi, newspapers chronicled a state bonfire where documents were burnt before the exit of the British. In Kenya, there were rumors of planes flying over the Indian Ocean to drop large crates of documents in what was count to be known as Operation Legacy. Both Elkins and Anderson have written articles on their account of the Mau Mau case and the discovery of the migrated archives. Riley Linbo has also written an article um, questioning the silences and invisibilities of the FCO 141 files. She notes that these documents are 10,000 kilometers away from their place of origin. They are thus more readily visible to strangers, blind though, may, though they may be, than to their kin. She goes on to point out that under its custody, FCO 141 is visible to those granted archival access, further mediated by racist border regimes, costly travel, and the privilege of time. So um, as for my research methods, I used a mixed method study incorporating archival research and interviews. I conducted expert and non-expert interviews under the auspice of the Museum of British Colonialism. And for my methodology, I studied select FCO 141 files at the National Archives in London. I was tracing the migration of the archives from Nairobi at the Kenya National Archives and I was interviewing experts on the politics of inaccess to the migrated archives. I also interviewed a few Mau Mau descendants on the importance of Mau Mau history to them. And so I began my research at the National Archives in Kew, and some of the files which I focused on were um, the, sec the disposal of classified records and accountable documents, the methods of destroying classified documents and the security of documents. 
At the Kenya National Archives in Nairobi, I identified a few files which provided a description of the brutality of colonialism, including letters from detainees, transfer of detainees who were ex-Manyani um, from the detention camps. And so for the non-expert interviews, I traveled to the White Highlands in Mola, um, Nakuru, Turi, Mona, and Gata to speak to a few descendants of Mau Mau victims. Among the places I visited in Molo were Turi, Mona, and Gata, like I mentioned, and the communities who lived in these locations are significant since they represent the Africans who lost their land to white settlers, became squatters on the white man's land, and were later resettled by the Kenyatta regime after Kenya gained independence. This community also represents a majority of my family and tells my family's story. I began by interviewing family members and through snowballing interviewed a few other members of the community. Some of them wanted to remain anonymous while others did not. While I assured them of anonymity, I could not promise confidentiality of their responses. Where permitted, I conducted video and audio interviews. I interviewed um, two respondents in Mona, one in Gata. I asked open-ended questions to allow the interviewees to provide me with a narrative of their recollection. And among the questions I asked were, were you or your family involved in the Mau Mau struggle? What role did you or did they play? Were you or were they punished for this involvement? And for the second part of my interviews, I traveled to Siokimao and Kitengela, where I interviewed two respondents who had um, responded to an advertisement that I had posted on social media. And so um, briefly going through the findings in the Hans Loop disclosure, um, the FCO 141 files cover, among other things, evidence of the meticulousness and the detailed planning that went into the Operation Legacy, including specific instructions for migrating and destroying documents from Kenya. In a letter from a colonial secretary, he explains that the necessity of a thorough purge of files which might embarrass Her Majesty's government, might embarrass members of the police, public servants of others, might compromise sources of intelligence, and might be used unethically by ministers in the successor government. These files, which are given the designation watch, must only be seen by authorized officers who are British subjects of European descent. And so um, about my positionality and uh, the family history of colonial brutality, um, this here is my Shushu and I in Molo this past summer, um, and it was actually taken a few days before she passed away. And the other picture is of my grandfather, Gidhuda, who was father to, uh, to my grandmother. And so from my family, I found a wealth of information on the Mau Mau struggle. Um, Gidhuda was part of Mau Mau and lived um, in a fertile part of Limuru, you may know as Tigoni. He was captured by colonial soldiers during Operation Anvil and later sent to Langata Detention Camp, now Langata Prison. He was thereafter detained at Atha River Detention Camp, now Kitengala Prison. And coincidentally, the place where I grew up and call home in Kitengala is five minutes away um, from Kitengala Prison where my grandfather was detained. When he was released, he found that his land had been grabbed by a white settler and that is, it's currently the location of the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock Research Organization Potato Research Center in Tigoni. His wives and children had been sent to the Lord de la Mer farm in Naivasha to work on the farm. In one of the final moments with my grandmother, she recounted to me how she sustained a permanent back injury from being beaten at the farm and she referred to her white masters as Munyafara in Kikuyu, which loosely translates to slave owner. After he was released, Gidhuda would pedal on his bicycle for 250 kilometers weekly from Naivasha to Molo to attend meetings on decolonization and redistribution of land through Kenyatta's million acre scheme. He would later relocate his family to Molo, although it would take him another 20 years of hard labor to repay the costs of the land provided through this controversial scheme. And so what were the limitations of my study? 
One of the limitations of my study was that I could not access the FC 141 files at um, the National Archives in London since they had been withdrawn. So I wrote them an email and this email circulated um, among FC 141 scholars. And if you'll allow me, I'll just read it very quickly. <clears throat> and so I said to them that um, I am dissatisfied with the treatment I have received from TNA and would like to request for further information on the withdrawal of the FC 141 files. I first contacted TNA on March 3rd, planning for my visit to view the records. I was conscious of the fact that the government had released these records to the public in several tranches since 2012. I made a bulk order request for the files and even received a letter from TNA to support my visa application. I went ahead and booked my flights and hotel accommodation and traveled over 3,000 miles to view these records only to be told that I could not access the FCO 141 files. This news came as a surprise to me as there was no official communication on the website nor on email stating that these archives were inaccessible. I said that I find it curious that TNA has chosen to withdraw these files at the end of COVID travel restrictions and the height of the summer period when overseas researchers are visiting the archive. Furthermore, the information I got at the front desk was inconsistent and unconvincing, that they had been withdrawn for conservation and later that they were under inspection for insecticides. It is also very inconsistent of TNA to assure me that my bulk order was available and support my visa application, only to inform me without prior notice that I cannot access these files. As you know, these archives contain vital information on Kenyan history and can only be accessed here at Kew Gardens, despite the fact that we are in the decolonization era. On this inaugural period of celebrating the 1921 census and British ancestry, I regret that TNA has erected barriers for me to access my own history and ancestry records. And I demand a written explanation on why such a huge archive of 2000 files has been withdrawn and additional access to all available copies. So as you can um, imagine, um, you know, I was able to meet with the manager, but the archives remained withdrawn for the following um, four months. And so Mandy Bunton, who was a former principal um, record specialist at the National Archives, wrote about this case. And she actually wrote that a Kenyan student at a US university was one frustrated user when she traveled to the UK, having put in an advance order only to be denied access. She was brave enough, I highlighted brave, or maybe just angry enough to demand a meeting with a manager. This outlined the conversation concerns but did not improve the situation for her. So what does it mean that the FCO and 41 files are withdrawn at the National Archive? Um, Dr. Mandy Burton writes in her article that TNA has treated researchers wishing to use the FCO 141 files with indifference, if not contempt. She observes that coincidentally or not, the withdrawal of the FCO 141 had followed requests to film part of the records which had been turned down. She also finds it curious that this withdrawal came at a time when overseas researchers are most likely to be visiting TNA. She quotes Tony Badger, noting the impossibility of alleviating the legacy of suspicion created by FCO 141 files. And so after about four months, um, a few weeks ago, the FC141 files were reinstated. However, the barriers that prevent Kenyan visitors from viewing them are still in place. And so in conclusion, among the ideas that I would like to discuss further in my paper are why must these archives be returned? What does that mean about decolonizing the production of knowledge and deracializing the writing of Kenyan history? How does reclaiming these archives um, serve as a response to the neo-colonial operation of their migration and concealment? And how would this serve as part of restorative justice for Mau Mau, who paid the price for Ithaka Naweadi? And so we have a picture there from the Museum of British Colonialism, where Juliet Erima says, Regisheni, Regisheni Kenya, Kumbukumbu Zamakavazi. 
And finally, I'd like to leave you with a Kikui proverb, which says, and this loosely means that, um, you know, so long as something goes missing in our house, we'll always blame the neighbor. Um, lastly, for acknowledgements, um, my success of my project is thanks to the support of my advisor, Dr. Danielle Smith, the African-American Studies Department at Syracuse University, the Maxwell African Students Union, and the Mark and Peel Internship Award. My personal thanks also to Professor David Anderson, um, Riley Lineba, Alex Wesley, Chao Minor, Max Spinkers, Wangwe Kimari, and Professor Shangwe, who all contributed to my work in one way or, or another. My eternal love for my grandmother for all her stories. May she continue resting in peace. And to my ancestors and to all Mau Mau fighters who died for freedom, peace, and power. Thank you. Sandy Sana Joy, I, I think I forgot to mention that Joy is a Pan Africanist. Uh, I forgot to mention that Joy is a Pan Africanist. She describes herself as, uh, as passionate about decolonization. And she has an organization known as Africa Yangu. She, she says that she's also passionate about Pan Africanism. I think I've already mentioned that African and African American history. African political economy and African international relations. That's a lot of stuff. Okay, so here we are now. We are very tired. I am very tired. And we are, I would like to request the chairman, if possible, at some point to create something like a discussion group, maybe WhatsApp or Telegram, so that this discussion can go on. And next time we have a conference, we plan for five days or maybe six days. So since that is in the future for now, I'd like to say that we are going to have uh, the discussions. How about uh, Dr. Abad Misigo is going to discuss uh, Kenneth Obongi's paper. Uh, 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 Masika is going to discuss Julius Mundi's paper. And Pamela Ngesa is going to discuss Joyce's paper. We've already discussed Laban's paper and there were no, no people who asked any questions about that. And then after that, we'll allow just one and a half questions per each. And then, uh, then we can be able to go home. So, so if that is agreeable, you can, of course, outvote me and I have two questions instead of one and a half. Two questions then. <laughs> two questions then. Hey. <laughs> okay. Karibu me, Herbert. Thank you very much indeed, uh, David. And thank you very much, my chair. I both and my agent for that wonderful and educative presentation on the omnibus um, of Mau Mau. Um, very interesting paper indeed. But before maybe I'll delve into that, let me uh, allow me Kula, to talk about just for one second about the last paper. And I think this is what we have been working on with the Masika. You're asking, yes, we are chasing after our stolen legacy. But what are we doing about our Kenyan National Archives? There's nothing there. You see, I've been talking to the director of the place and says, due to poor pay from the government, the staff are literally selling some of the documents. <laughs> yeah. So what are you going to do to preserve what we are having now before lamenting yeah, and asking for what is preserved elsewhere? There is a whole section under UNESCO called Preservation of National Heritage and Memory of the World. Kila knows it. I think we should be able to pursue that and see how far we can go on that. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So going back then to my classmate uh, Pepper, um, he has given us a whole history of it all. And because of time, I wouldn't want to go through it, but I raised one or two issues uh, that he talked about the department. Uh, he talked about the department, the way it was. Um, 
but I'm sure he'll also talk to Ngesa and Madam Mary Wanyoike about how education was important in the Mau Mau uprising, particularly the Picha report of 1949 that then was implemented in 1952, right? Um, and then secondly, he talked about uh, the whole issue of the African, the first African chairman. Up to now, what we are seeing to Professor Murioki, and then from there, Salim, name them. My question is, was Professor Ogot listening to the ground at that time? You see, uh, so that we see it now, uh, perhaps going through his students, Mwanzi, Indangasis, name them. You see, you want to listen to the ground to get something from the government the way you have been doing, isn't it? And therefore, <laughs> Uh, if the government is silent on Mau Mau stories and you are chair, will you come loudly and say, we are supporting this, or you say, I am going to see what I can do and gain from the establishment. And this then happens even in the 80s, in the 90s, we see Professor Mwanzi, um, the one party rule, and the professor is going to state house. Yeah. Not necessarily because of academia, but to preserve their job and do something else. I was sitting on the same board with the Professor Mwansi who told me the president gave him land in Kisumu. And therefore, <laughs> there's no way he was going to say we allow multipartism. So you see, we perhaps listening to the ground and see what is happening. And therefore, perhaps we should look at it how do we enable the scholars to discuss issues without putting their stomachs first, right? You see, it comes now naturally that scholars are poorly paid. And that's why most of us will want to resign to be an MCA and in particular to be a CEC, County Executive uh, Member. The scholarship then is lost through the window. So you see, how do we do that? My second concern is then, if Mau Mau and Kenyan history is this crucial to us, how many petitions have we made to the um, Commission for University Education to make history, for example, a compulsory unit to all the cadres? I know UNESCO has tried with the general history of Africa, but Kenya has not implemented it, although we were the proposers of that motion. Yeah, so why can't we make history a more interesting area so that everybody is accommodated in this omnibus, right? So that we teach history to medical students so that they can understand Mau Mau plus the various and um, the, the various discussion uh, uh, on it, yeah, and how really we can then develop this nationalism through our history, because we can't develop this nationalism when we don't understand where we are going. So my last issue will be: Did the government influence the disarmament or the disbanding? of the Historical Association of Kenya. Thank you. Sana Mwalimu Hubbard, I think those who are listening keenly would have identified job opportunities there and research opportunities there and funding for projects. Uh, Dr. Mishigo is talking about retrieval of the archive and he's saying there is money. He even named the organization where the money is. So that's a challenge to people who know how to write proposals for funding. To get funding so that we can get this archive back. Any questions, please? Or should we now have uh, everybody uh, discuss and then we have uh, questions, eh? I think that's a better one, yeah? So I'm going to call upon uh, Masika. And then Pamela uh, Tatufungia Thank you. 
thank you very much, uh, Malimu and the rest. And just to revisit what Dr. Misigo said, apart from what's getting lost in the archive, one day I woke up and it was on the news that a full gallery has been looted in Kitale Museum. I was born and raised in Kitale and up to now, no one has been brought to book. Another sad story for historians. Uh, I'm brief, I'm going to be brief on what uh, Mr. Julius Muindi uh, presented, broadening the geographical coverage of Mau Mau. He gave us a very uh, detailed account on the Akamba, uh, broadening the geography to the Akamba territory and gave us uh, various sites within the Akamba. And indeed it is true. Uh, you will agree that in 1954, uh, the security forces arrested over 230 Akamba fighters who are said to be Mau Mau uh, and sent to detention. Uh, in 1953, there were Kamba Othing, uh, Kamba Othing teams in Arusha. We have not talked about that. Uh, and thank you therefore for broadening the uh, geographical sphere into the Akamba territory and now into the uh, uh, in, uh, far all the way to Arusha. Uh, and again, if you look at many Akamba carvings, we have a lot of depiction of Mau Mau within the Akamba carvings. Uh, maybe also, uh, as Mwalimu Kule said, we need a geographical map of where Mau Mau operated. Uh, then we need also to bring on board the Maasai Mau Mau, the story that also remains silent. Yet we know Mze Paita was a Mau Mau leader in Kajado uh, and was imprisoned for being a leader of Mau Mau. Uh, and uh, also in Narok, we had General Kurito, Ole Kisio, yet we don't talk about it. Then we need to uh, widen that geographical area uh, to bring on board just as Malimu uh, Kule said. Uh, in Mombasa, we also had uh, the Mau Mau cells in Mombasa, Pemba, in Zanzibar, which are also not well detailed. But perhaps a very important thing that, a very important point that we need also to bring on the fore is the tighter involvement in uh, the question of Mau Mau. Indeed, if you went to uh, Kenyatta Caves, which are actually known by the locals as Kino Caves, they are footprints of Mau Mau. And they will tell you, look here, they were even sleeping here inside this cave. We need to widen that uh, also. Uh, it's actually in Mwangui, Mwangui uh, village within uh, Taita. So we, we need actually to bring, uh, to widen our sphere to those regions. Finally, uh, the spread of Mau Mau even outside the Kenyan territory, apart from Tanganyika or Tanzania by then, South Africa. Uh, we have praised President Kibaki or the Kibaki administration for bringing on the fore the idea of Mau Mau. But then where did the idea come from? The visit by Nelson Mandela in July, hoping to see the grave of Field Marshal Dedan Kimathi. But when he arrived here, he was told the grave is nowhere. That's when he demanded that, can I then look for the widow? And that's when Kenya now awoke and said, oh, she is still alive. Then we started parading her in national holidays, including Field Marshal Mudoni was just here. We, uh, yeah. So we need, to widen this uh, sphere, which is a very good uh, idea or spreading the geographical region to uh, demystify the concept of Mau Mau being a Kikuyu idea. And many has been said, many has said, have said about uh, the aspect of uh, utilizing the narrative of Mau Mau for political mileage. We have debated this and we can go on debating it brought the split 
in the department, my chair spoke about it and all through that. Thank you very much, uh, Malimu and Mr. Julius for taking us out of central Kenya to other geographical regions where Mau Mau operated. Thank you. Sana. Sana, Sana. Let's, uh, let's just hear what uh, Pamela is going to take, take, on, take us home. Um, uh, it is good evening to people here and good morning or good afternoon or good night to others elsewhere, whatever applies. Um, Joy Mukabi, thank you very much for that presentation. You have uh, introduced a new aspect into our discussion an aspect which nobody else has talked about in the sense of migrated archives. We've been touching it here and there, but there has not been a presentation as um, comprehensive as given by Joy. And uh, Joy has taken us through a background. She's actually telling us how she has tried to um, gather her data, the methodology, the questions, the interviews, and indeed it's also comprehensive what she means to do. And then she has also taken us through a bit of um, the findings, um, the kind of evidence she's been able to gather and so on and so forth. It, we were all there, so I, we, I, I don't need to uh, bore you with that. Um, and what comes out uh, from my point of view is that we are still colonized. We are so badly colonized that we cannot even access records of events that concern our own country. We can't access them. They were migrated. Some were, were burnt, some were destroyed. And she indeed said she's going to approach this through the point of view of neocolonialism. And I think we all understand what neocolonialism is all about. You know, the powers that be continue to control us in various ways from a distance and sometimes from very close, our economies, our politics, and in many other ways are controlled by a colonizer. And these days we don't just have a colonizer, we have several of them. That's the unfortunate bit. We have several of them. The British could be keeping our documents, but we have world bodies like the World Bank, the IMF, who sometimes say, you know, at one point, our former uh, and late president, Moi said, these people keep on changing goalposts. They tell us to do A, we do it, and then now they want us to do this. I mean, where exactly do they want us to go? What do they want us to do? When they give us money, they give us at a very high interest rate, and to others, they give at a fair rate. Those others are already rich. So then it takes us to the Bible. The poor, what, what is it? Matthew, is it in Matthew 19 something? Yeah? To those who have, more will be added and to those who do not have even what they have. So imperialism begins from the Bible? I don't know. Anyway, it is a form of imperialism. The migrated archives is a form of imperialism. I don't think um, we can describe it better. But then I'll go to what um, 
Dr. Misigo said, I think um, Misigo actually set the ball rolling. He's saying we should try to get back the migrated archives. And I agree with him. And I want to ask, all these years, 60 years of independence, we've had government after government. None of them ever thought it's important to get the migrated archives. I, I don't know, I, I don't want to lie that I know anything, but if anybody knows what they have done, if they have tried to follow up, maybe you could inform us during question and comment time. And then um, Dr. Misigo says that what we have in the archives, what we already had, because the employees there are being paid so poorly, they are selling the documents to get money. I, um, I wanted some documents. I wanted the city council minutes. I wanted the, the Hoka files for, for work that I'm doing. And when I asked for them in the archives, they had some up to, I think about 1980. So I asked them, where are the rest? And I was told, no, we have never uh, received them because we don't have space. Yeah? And so I asked them, now, what do I do? He said, they said, you go to the city council. They have them there. So I went to the city council offices. And um, I asked them for the minutes. I've been reading them there. Many of the minute books have been destroyed. They are missing. I think some of them have gotten lost. But the worst thing is that the Hoka files, which carry a lot of information, were burnt. And they told me clearly, we burnt them because we did not have enough space for them. Yes, they did. So we are not doing well even ourselves. Yes, we might be talking about the migrated archives. But are we doing, are we archiving what we have here? There is a lot that needs to be done. Thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to me. Leo ni Leo. <laughs> there have been uh, quite a number of uh, revelations, so I'm going to give you one revelation just before I give George the opportunity to talk. I was doing excavations at Iraq Shale in 1990, and I was following up excavations done by both Mary Licky and Louis Licky and uh, JC Onyango Abuje, the late Professor Onyango Abuje. And one of the open sites that was put there for public expert before I started the excavations was a full skeleton, a real one, not a, not a cast. And then at some time, I'm told, I went back there, you know, after a month or two or something like that, and I found out that the skeleton was missing. So I inquired from Maina, who was the caretaker of the site, and he said the skeleton had been stolen. And somebody was caught at the airport with it. But it was never returned. So somehow the fellow ended up still living with it anyway. And that led to a bylaw by somebody, I don't know whether it was NMK or whatever, that such open sites are not going to be having real skeletons. So, so now what you get in such places are, is fiberglass, which almost looks like the real thing. It's almost like a photocopy of the original. So it, it seems like uh, the, the, the loss is not just in documents, but also in tangibles. Okay, so I, I think it's a really worrying um, situation as we complain about things. We also need to be able to look at our own backyard and see what we can be able to do. Right now, and I can see you on your phones, um, if you try to search for a Neolithic ring, you'll get it. And it will be from a site in Kenya because we lost all of it. It's something that people don't like to talk about. We lost all the materials from Joro River Cave, which contained uh, not just in Joro River Cave, but also Nakuru and several other sites. These are some of the sites that we pride ourselves in. They, they, the collection in, included precious stones that are worth, they're just priceless. Let's don't even put a price to it. 
because if you say you want to have a Neolithic bracelet, there's only one that exists. So I can say I want a billion dollars and you take it or leave it. But you can find them on, in Amazon and Pazera. We lost them in Dar Salaam because uh, somebody at the museum loaned them as security for the old Dubai collection, which some people who wanted to work on could not work on them in Tanzania because of politics. So we borrowed them on their behalf. And the Tanzanians said, if you're going to have it, we want something to hold on to. So we gave them that collection. That's the last time we saw them. But you can be able, I hear, to find them on whatever these online stores and so on, going for hundreds of thousand dollars per piece. I'm going to have two questions. Yes, George. And then, <laughs> wow, 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 wow. OK, Mickey, and I don't know your name, Ben. Yeah, in that order. There are many questions, I yes. told you. Just, just, just <laughs> make them short questions. Yeah. Mine is, is quick uh, question and comment. Uh, this is to Mwali Mumbongi, and that it follows on uh, Dr. <coughs> uh, Hubbard's, Hubbard's uh, observation. Um, I, I wanted to ask what, what was uh, uh, President Moy's role in uh, either fanning the deficiencies in the department and uh, subsequently to the migration of members of staff elsewhere. Um, the, the, how about I think you're talking about the politics of the belly, right? Uh, but but there's, there's more, and I hope I'll, I'll give a paper on that. There's more than explaining the, the begging and going to Daniel Adder Moy beyond uh, the politics of the belly. When, when I was doing my PhD, my professor said that was shortchanging the actual uh, explanation. So there's something more to explain academic, so what you call academic psychophysics, right? So it was just a to comment and more little addition. So Miki, tonight I round. Miki, then the lady in green, uh, David, Ben, and then uh, I don't know your name, but that guy and then the museum. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, presenters. Um, I'm going to just try to make this as uh, quick as possible. Um, this has been an excellent conference, and I would like um, to see perhaps uh, we can figure out a way to do something about some of the things that we talked about. For example, the archives is something I feel like <laughs> I'm always saying, what can we do? What can I do? Um, you know, collectively, what can we do? Can we, from today, put together a group of people or spearheaded, of course, from with the University of Nairobi, and we follow through with something, and then we have to, you know, present back to this body or other other institutions to try to actually find, uh, figure out a way to get to the information because I. It's hard to work. Uh, I'm sure you feel that way too. It's frustrating. And you have departments that don't want to fund you to go to London or whatever and so on. So we're at a disadvantage. So that's one. Uh, two, uh, regarding our heroes and so on, I, that's another point that I'd like to see. Perhaps there's more that we can do uh, collectively as scholars, uh, mile, mile, to figure out how we can um, move forward, know all their names or have something. I think um, there was a gentleman yesterday that talked about how he's preserving some information. Perhaps more of us can get on board so we can then educate our communities and our students and so on. So those are my two requests. Just maybe we can do something like have action that's what I'd like to come out of this, because this has been excellent. Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Maybe That's next okay. time, chairman of right. an attack, conference attack. My name is King Wakamenchu. Um, many years ago, I was a student at this department, and I just came across this uh, the conference, and I was so excited uh, just to hear about it, and I took it upon myself to disseminate it everywhere. So I'm in the I mean the space. I mean the. I mean the journalistic space and the civil society space, um, and it's given me an opportunity to just like <clears throat> have like a broad overview of what's been happening um, in terms of change. Because I work with change makers, um, and one thing that I noticed, I kept on noticing time and again, was uh, the struggles, especially the financial struggles, uh, the well-being struggles. So when 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 uh, Professor Misigo talked about the archival material being sold, it really stood out to me because. 
it made me think that there's no longer anything sacred. The, everything is profane. And it's like, it's, it's, it's related to culture. It's not actually even so much about the, the money that they, they are being paid. Cause I don't think, I think the government has like a minimum amount in which it pays its people. Um, so it's about that, that the approach needs to be on a, on a cultural level and, and also recognizing that where we are right now, this level of depravity, this level of soullessness, this culture of violence, a lot of it comes, it really is a relic of the colonial legacy, which I liked what that gentleman in glasses talked about that where are we right now, we actually still are there. We actually are in, in that trauma, in that trauma, um, traumatic legacy. And so we keep on repeating patterns of trauma. So which is why our politics is continually patterns of violence and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, just because I know that time is going. Um, for me, the academic space is a, is a very key space of liberation. Um, and like these kinds of conversations are so soulful because like we are all here at this time, it's 7.20, but we are still here because we know that there's something happening. Um, that to me, this, this, this kind of conversations are already answering um, the questions that need to be answered. And just also to, um, to talk about that, again, back to the culture is that we heard about the, the Mau Mau guys, they were not, they, they were getting money out of their own pockets. Like, so it was not about the money per se, it was about um, the soul, the state of the soul. And which again goes back to when, uh, yeah, that, that the problem in Kenya is not, is not lack of money or poor pay, like we've seen with Kenya anti-corruption and other commissions where a lot of money, but then money still gets stolen. So yeah, just to end that, this is a space of liberation. Um, but a very big thing is about connecting, connecting the struggles. So I've been in the media space, I'm in the civil society space. I um, mean, I see that a lot of the problems are the same. Um, and also like when we talk about, even in the, in the worker spaces, like the, the medics, the teachers, we are all going to the same thing. And so the politics has not been, uh, um, there's been attempts to reclaim it, but to, to reclaim the soul of the nation from there, but it hasn't been so successful. But I'm actually very, very um, optimistic about this academic space being the space to, um, to, to get us out of the problem that we are, but we also need to then start doing things differently, um, have a different eye on things. I liked when, uh, I think it was yesterday, how Professor Mbongi gave a recommendation to the gentleman uh, uh, from Karatina saying that he could have a potential, he potentially could set what he's doing as a, as a tourist attraction, something. So that's already revenue, that's already money. Um, and uh, so even me myself, like, I'm new in this space of uh, sort of like trying to give support to change makers um, financially, not, not, that, not money wise, but even just helping think through models, possibilities, um, because are, the opportunities are there. Like for example, uh, Professor Gona, your, your, your presentation yesterday, already I'm seeing it having very important linkages with the current um, human rights defenders. So there's an opportunity to just also connect you with some of the groups. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much. It's been amazing. Sandy Sana, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's very eye-opening. Um, yeah, uh, David? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe, uh, Kingwa, if you will have won as a presidential candidate, the other time you ran, things will be different. So maybe you try it again. <laughs> uh, thank you. My question are directed to my chair, uh, Dr. Kenneth Ombongi. Uh, the pen was mightier than the sword. Uh, you gave us uh, an uh, detailed history on the department. Uh, do you think that it is the division of pen in the department that killed patriotism? That killed patriotism. Why am I saying this? We've talked about loss of documents. Uh, when there was an uprising in uh, Egypt, it just took one professor to save the museum because people had looted the, the Nile Valley Museum in Egypt, in Cairo. But one professor of history reminded the people that the things you are looting and selling, you are selling them at a throwaway price, your children will pay millions to access it. If you are patriotic enough, return those artifacts. And the next two days, people had dumped them outside the museum. So do you think that that division that began in the Department of History is responsible for the death of patriotism in, the, in a nation that does not even understand the value of its records and culture? 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Me, I'm going to be very brief and uh, I'm directing my comment uh, question to Muindi and Masika. They did talk about broadening the struggle. Mau Mau struggle outside, uh, I don't know, they were, I, I mean, and I guess they are talking about uh, outside central Kenya. When Masika was discussing the paper, he did say that, you know, we have caves in Taita and all that. But, you know, I was asking myself, if we have caves in Taita, where do you call them Kenyatta caves? Ideological, that's a form of colonialism. Because then we are talking of Kenyatta who comes from central Kenya and the cave is in Taita. You cannot find an alternative name <laughs> to give it so that we see that the war is outside. You can see some of us are still not convinced that this war was actually fought outside central Kenya. Central Kenya. Because the people from there already accept that there is someone, they have imported a name from Central Kenya and given it to an icon in their place. So I leave this conference uh, not convinced that uh, the war about Mau Mau was outside Central Kenya. Thank you very much. Okay, Sansana Ben, I hope Julius is, is, is still with us so that he can answer that question when the time comes. You are the last one, right? No, no, you and yeah, just go and then you are the last one. Just to, to you, one question. And one question. Okay. I think let me go first and then he will wind up. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a comment from uh, his previous question. And then I also have a challenge to the Department of History and Archaeology. He talked about uh, scholars philosophizing ideas and sp speaking Greeks which is out of touch with the hustlers. I want to kind of correct the notion. Until you are able to philosophize something, it will be very difficult for you to diagnose and inform the society the correct history. So what we are trying to do here is to get the exact history of this country in relation to Mau Mau, then we educate our public, our general public, then they, it will inform their further action. So it's very much in order what we are doing here. Secondly, I've seen a lot of research about Mau Mau, which has been done, has uh, centered around Mount Kenya region. And I want to point out one thing. Majority of the population there today is under the age of 40. And they do not know anything about Mau Mau other than the historical gossips which Dr. Gona was talking about. So I think it is time the Department of History and Archaeology needs to come out and straighten this thing for the purposes of enriching our future generations. It's not enough to say that Moy divided the department. That's why we are passive. It's time we need to be extremely active so that you occupy your space before our sister universities, uh, KU and others, yeah, they occupy that space. Then finally, concerning the idea of uh, our artifacts or our archives which are being stolen and others being sold, where are the agitators? You know, and you see this is, it is calls for each one of us, yeah? What is it that we are doing? This university has acquired a new television uh, station. Why don't we use it yeah, to champion some of these things? Majority of the people working in these ministries that are concerned with the kind of protecting our national heritage, they are our students. Yeah? Low hanging fruits. Why don't we take advantage yeah, of these people so that we can secure what is rightfully ours as a nation? Thank you. Okay, um, my name is Kevashi Agato. I'm an artist. 
but um, history and the art go very closely together. We artists are very good in uh, capturing the spiritual moment. Maybe not the historical moment, but the spiritual moment. Now, let me put, say just three things. One, from this conference, it will be very clear that imperialism has succeeded in dividing Kenyans about their own history that we still do not own even our own struggle for independence. Because whether it was done in central province, whether it was done in Nyanza, whether it was done in coast, it is irrelevant. The issue is we are one nation. And that's what we should be talking about. But imperialists have succeeded in dividing us, even at this level, or even accepting that we had a common struggle for independence of this nation. That's one. Secondly, it's very interesting that please you scholars of the department here do not ignore, ignore the churches. You know the churches, Catholic church, the Anglican church, the mainstream churches have got rich history, rich archives that can be used and they are very badly kept, badly kept. As we look at also the national archives, there is a lot of information that you can get about our own history that has been kept by the AIC, AIM, these old, that some of them have records that go back up to even 1899. Or even, eight, well, like for example, there's a piece of letter outside there which belonged to a church that is 100 years old. That is, so look at that also. Second, thirdly, and maybe the last one, this statement that we are talking about here, and you are asking you, Department of History and the university and all of us, particularly the patriotic ones, do not think that it's going to be an easy journey. Prepare yourself for a fight because there will be a fight and you will be divided. It is not going to be easy. And let us look for also cultural activists that can stand out and say, here we are activists for culture for history. We don't have a historical activists from you, but we are going to be sure you are going to fight, you are going to face fight and you're going to face resistance. But if you, if you dig deeper and deeper into why our society is as it is right now. Thank you very much. Asante Sana. So um, I'm going to, thank you very much all the questions uh, online. Yes, Chair, uh, I'm online. The hands, uh, please go ahead. That would be Bitengo. Yes, my name is Wilson Bitengo. Thank you for the organizers of the conference. I'm lead learning. My question goes to Dr. Bongi, who is my elder in the SDA Church, uh, concerning the, the controversy of history association of Kenya. Was there any effort made to reconcile the protagonists in this department of history and archaeology so that we can be able to know whether it was, there was a reconciliation made? And if there was no reconciliation, why was not there reconciliation? So that we can be able to see where the problem started and where, if there is any solution so that we can be able to revive it. Thank you, Asante Sana. Mutua Bebe Mkonoju. I think we, we don't have any more hands. Uh, or, uh, yeah. So, um, who do we start with? Malimu? This thing on. Well, let, let me start yeah, with uh, uh, appropriately and conveniently uh, from the question asked by Pitengo, uh, a member of my church, uh, so that I can continue to be uh, a member and uh, an elder of good and regular standing. Uh, that is the terminology we normally use. 
and uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, our sounds engineers are actually members of my my church, Isaiah and uh, uh, Marvin and the rest, they, they come from my local church. So there's a way in which my church has played a role in facilitating this conference. Uh, I, I thought you would say amen for that. Yeah, the, the boys who are covering uh, this conference online are from uh, Karangata Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, in uh, the intersection between uh, Langata and Karen. That's why we are called uh, Karangata. Uh, now, I, I guess uh, Vitango was coming from that um, spiritual perspective of reconciliation. Uh, when you differ, you, you forgive how many times? <laughs> um, I, I probably have not come across uh, any record uh, within the department and uh, with some of the former academics that uh, I've been talking to uh, on attempts for reconciliation. And um, I can only guess the reason why um, uh, th those of us who are uh, academics, uh, th there is uh, some level of, uh, I don't want to call it arrogance. I probably want to call it uh, independence uh, that we uh, come with and deal with things. Um, I, I, what I know is that um, there is a way in which the historical association of Kenya has not died. Uh, because uh, when you read uh, Professor God, he speaks like he's still the chair. Because uh, when he was dethroned uh, the, with the efforts that were made by Atieno the Amba and a few people here, uh, after that meeting that was at Gandhi Wing, room 213, he actually names the room in his. Uh, uh, autobiography. Uh, I, I think later he proceeded as if uh, uh, everything was okay. So reconciliation, I'm not sure why. Um, uh, it's probably because of the nature of, 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 of what uh, we, we do as uh, people belong to the academy. Uh, we are over independent, uh, overly independent. And uh, sometimes we come across uh, as fairly arrogant. Uh, I'm not saying we are, but uh, uh, there's that um, uh, notion uh, that, that uh, you find there. And, and then um, you, you see the historians we are talking about uh, became academics uh, at a time when being an academic was something. Um, you see, I will believe that uh, when some of these scholars uh, were here, Akino Diambo, Akina Ogot, Akina Mukarunganga, Akina Maina Wakinyati, Akina, they could have been the first uh, from their backgrounds. Um, you, you know, if as recent as my time, I could probably be the first PhD holder. Uh, from my wide uh, extended family, which is not small. Uh, so how about uh, the Ogotis, the Ochiengis, uh, the Adiambos, uh, uh, the, 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 the Muriokis and, and the rest. So I, I think um, it, it couldn't have been easy to, to uh, you know, change the grandstanding and, and, and the very strong positions uh, that were taken uh, based on uh, sometimes ideology, uh, sometimes um, uh, what, what uh, somebody could uh, uh, probably read as ethnic Jehovanism uh, or, or um, the, 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 the politics of the belly and, and all that, you can give them all the names. So I think Kibitengo, uh, I've answered your, your question and I'm still in good books with you. Um, I, I, I like what um, the uh, Kipashia is, is saying about the conviction uh, that uh, we need to develop in the fight for a certain cause. 
the, 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 there have been debates in the department, uh, particularly in the 70s and the 80s, uh, about history for what? Uh, there's a group uh, that says, uh, we pursue uh, historical knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Uh, there are others uh, who say we pursue uh, historical knowledge for a cause, uh, particularly uh, the, the socialist Marxist historians, uh, they, they pursue uh, historical knowledge for a cause, the transformation of society to make it more just, more equal and more fair and more accommodative uh, to both the top dogs and the underdogs. Um, uh, with these uh, 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 strands, in uh, historical thinking and historical knowledge with its utility, um, we are bound to have uh, uh, differences. Uh, but then uh, differences are not bad. Uh, you know, what is bad is uh, when differences split you. I have uh, had uh, a privilege of getting my education in three uh, continents. I, I call myself a product of a triple heritage. Uh, academic differences are all over. In fact, if you go to uh, Jawaharlal University in, in, in New Delhi, uh, where I did my MPhil, they have even more differences than, uh, but you see, the, the university has this strong Marxist inclination. Uh, and you've heard recently, uh, they, they are strongly and, um, uh, and 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 uh, you know uh, uh, the establishment so, so strongly, uh, uh, but the point I'm bringing forth is that um, divergence of opinion is healthy. That's why we have scholarship. Uh, if we all agree uh, on one thing, then there will be no innovation. There will no invention uh, because of the interrogation and asking questions consistently and constantly. That is only when we create new knowledge and, and we encourage that. Uh, our students should not ask the questions we ask, uh, should look at things much more differently, should interrogate the positions that uh, we, we, we take, because that's the only way of creating uh, new knowledge. Uh, Masika, um, who, who killed the patriotism? Well, my, my straightforward answer is, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure. That's much more sim simple to, to put it. I guess it's not simplistic. Uh, but then uh, again, I have delved into this issue before uh, when I was talking about uh, the creation and the recreation of identity uh, in, 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 in the country uh, where uh, we, we have this binary of, uh, you, you know, uh, us and them, uh, normally uh, when we have a situation where competition is involved, we have a situation where we are sharing the so-called national kick. I've never seen it. Um, we normally tend to take recourse to what I call the small social universes. That's not my term. Uh, that's a term of uh, the, the, the Indian scholar I was referring you to, Satish Sabruel, in his book, uh, 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 Roots of Cli uh, Crisis, Sociological Analysis of Modern India. Uh, we, we, we take recourse to the small social universes of uh, community, uh, you, you know, clan, uh, family. Um, if, if every time we face a challenge that needs to be confronted, we want to confront it in form of my community, uh, uh, you know, my clan. Uh, when you are done with your clan, then my family. I, I guess probably that is where the, the, the challenge is. Uh, Mr. Kibachia talks about Kenya being a nation. Um, that's subject to debate. Uh, Kenya as a single nation is an imperial creation. Uh, which has gone through challenges over the years. Uh, Kenya, as many nations, 
predated uh, imperialism, but used by imperialism to undermine the unity of different communities or what some people call different nations in, in the country. And hence the idea of divide and, 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 and rule. Uh, you know, so, so, so um, nationhood is still um, uh, 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 a notion that uh, we need to relook at and, 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 and evaluate and uh, look at the concept of nationalism, uh, patriotism, and many other isms that speak of national identity and see uh, uh, whether they have worked for us. Uh, this far, from the little knowledge that I have, uh, they have not. Uh, you know, that is why even in this conference, uh, which is predominantly made of multiple degree holders, uh, we are talk still talking about regions. We are still talking about communities. We are still uh, saying, well, uh, uh, this should rule, this, that should rule. Uh, 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 we, we still need to have a debate. That, that, that's that's uh, an issue even in the corridors of the University of Nairobi. Um, uh, I'm sure if, if, if you uh, go into our files, our records, uh, you will hear consistent and constant complaints of uh, certain decisions uh, that have been taken on the basis of uh, uh, the, 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 the first letter of your surname, um, uh, you, you know, which is, uh, uh, which is very common. Uh, we, we value that. Um, there, there are times uh, uh, when you, 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 your surname can either work for you or work against you. Uh, I've given this testimony before that uh, there's a time I got a job uh, because of uh, 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 the letter O in my surname. And, and this is um, uh, an organization that was headed by uh, nine Kenyans. And, and, and they assumed that uh, the, the O is good. Uh, and and uh, uh, after they realized that I'm not the O of the place where they were thinking, then it became a problem. And then they had nothing to do because we had already signed uh, the, the contract. Now, uh, Dr. Gona, Moe's role in muscling the department and funding uh, differences. Um, it's, it's a very uh, uh, difficult. President Moe uh, just died recently, uh, probably to take a bit of time before we begin to interrogate some of the actions and decisions that um, uh, he, he, he took. But all I know, and, and this is in the public domain, is that uh, the Department of History and Archaeology during the Moy administration produced uh, very disproportionately when you compare it with other departments in the university, uh, some of the people who worked for the Moy administration. Uh, at some point, uh, uh, a historian was the head of the public service and the head of Kenya's cabinet, Dr. Sally Kosgei, a lady who worked in this uh, department uh, uh, that we are. And, and several colleagues, uh, of course, I'm speaking retrospectively, I was not there, uh, but since we are historians, I can call them colleagues. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 the department has produced, uh, again, very disproportionately ambassadors representing the country in different uh, foreign missions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you remember uh, Dr. Benjamin Kipkoril, at some point, one of the longest serving uh, 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 Kenya's ambassador to the United States, uh, Mickey. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Dr. Yusuf Unzubo. Uh, who worked, I think, in Switzerland and, and Netherlands uh, for a while. Um, uh, the, the role of uh, uh, Professor Ida Salim uh, uh, as uh, the intellectual arm of uh, uh, President Moy, I think is very well known, is in public domain, uh, that is even the one who wrote uh, this famous book, African Nationalism, uh, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but then 
Um, then there is um, uh, Professor William Ochen, who at some stage was uh, when a PS in 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 the State House, uh, uh, in the office of the uh, the, the, the 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 president. Uh, th th there is a trend there. Uh, and the trend is uh, very interesting and it fits within uh, 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 the familiar uh, uh, politics of identity in the country. Uh, one fits within, it seems to me that um, the, 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 the establishment scholars uh, from history were mainly uh, people who uh, thought that um, uh, Mau Mau was overrated as a national movement, uh, as, as a nationalist movement. Uh, the views of uh, the late William Ojeang are, are very well known uh, about, uh, 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 you, you know, uh, the, the, the Mau Mau. And um, one time he, 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 he talked about Mau Mau being um, um, which word you use? I can't remember the exact words, but uh, something akin to uh, one of the most dangerous uh, movements in the, in, in, in the country. Uh, 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 Professor Gott is still around, uh, but um, he, he very tactively uh, straddled between uh, uh, being ant and pro establishment. Uh, that's why he, he, he held, I think, uh, some of the high profile uh, 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 positions in a number of institutions uh, from the National uh, Museums and then the founder director of the Africa uh, Institute for African Studies. And at some point uh, he was actually a director, I think, in Kenya Commercial Bank uh, uh, and, 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 many other, uh, and many other institutions. And um, uh, 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 Grace Ogot, uh, you know, he was a very strong uh, pro Kanu uh, agent from, uh, from CIA in the days when Kanu was not very popular. Uh, so, so I'm trying to uh, make inferences here that um, uh, remotely there could be poss a possibility of uh, the hand of the establishment in the direction that uh, 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 things took, uh, not just in the Department of History, but I also know the Department of Literature and the Department of Political Science, uh, which were uh, very vibrant. I'm finishing, I'm finishing. Very vibrant at some stage. And, and probably we are back now, and I hope things will be well. Um, then uh, th there's the last question. Uh, from uh, my classmate and contemporary, uh, Dr. Misigo, uh, was uh, Professor God listening uh, to the real world on the ground? Very difficult question to answer. I, I, I can probably only conjecture uh, that um, uh, when you speak to a number of uh, people, uh, 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 Professor God was a wonderful historian, a, a, a great, um, uh, uh, a great man. Uh, but perhaps he needed to do a little bit more to enhance uh, levels of collegiality in, in, in not only in the department, uh, but also in the historical association of 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 of, of Kenya. Uh, I, I think I will leave it there. But the last point I wanted to make is uh, that um, in the 70s and the 80s and 90s, uh, the department suffered uh, from uh, brain drain, a lot of it, actually, both to local and the institutions abroad. Many people went to KU, uh, uh, our daughter uh, uh, department, uh, not sister. Uh, a number of them went to Maseno. Uh, actually, Professor Gott and Ucheng went from KU, they went to Maseno and then from Maseno to uh, Moi uh, University. And I have a sense in which we, we, we suffered both ways. Uh, there was brain drain, and for those who remained because of the environment, there was also some notion of drained brains. 
of, of some kind because uh, people confine themselves to safe areas of historical analysis, uh, which will not put them in trouble. Uh, 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 and um, uh, if, if you look at the publications emanating from the department, uh, there was a deliberate move uh, to avoid controversial, potentially controversial subjects. So you steer clear and, and you remain on the safe uh, uh, lane. And, and hence um, the, 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 the dismissal from uh, Ngugi that what remained uh, uh, in the institution were uh, probably Pochua historians or chroniclers. Thank you. Sandy Sana, for that uh, short and long response to all these questions. Um, I'd like to ask if Julius is still on to respond to, I think it was one or two questions. Bye, please, bye, please, bye, please, bye, please, bye. The questions that were asked. Is Julia still with us? Okay, and Joy? Joy, I can. Yes. Enjoy. So, Joy, you oh, can Joy. respond to one or two questions that were asked about your presentation. Yes, um, I got the comments. I didn't get the questions, though. I think maybe the, the question Ask that I can... to come and do what you're supposed to do as it is identified in the program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jambo. My name is Gilbert Wafula. I'm a lecturer in the Department of History and Archaeology. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, for giving me this auspicious opportunity to give you a vote of thanks. I would like to begin by citing an American author who is known as Melody Beatty, who is quoted to have said, gratitude makes sense of the past, brings peace for today, and creates a vision for the future. Our sincere appreciations go out to all of you who have participated in this conference in one way or another, whether you are online or whether you are here physically with us, whether you are in Kenya or whether you are abroad. We say thank you very much. Special thanks go to ordinary Kenyans, the common Mwanainchi, who have attended this conference. Their attendance is very important because the obligation of universities cannot be gainsaid when it comes to providing new knowledge, which helps the wider society to grapple with their with its challenges. Therefore, we thank you very much, the common Manaiji who have been here with us, who have seen so many people come, and uh, we say thanks. Public participation is one of the major tenets of our constitution. Therefore, we say thank you very much. I would also like to say thank you very much to our colleagues from different departments of the university and from different universities, KU. I've seen other, our, some of our colleagues who are here. Thank you, 
our colleagues from different parts of the world, from the US, we have seen you, from, I just want to say thank you very much, colleagues. I also want to say thank you very much to our postgraduate students who have played a very great part in, in helping to run this conference. And uh, I'm also very happy to see our former students like uh, Kingwa Kamenchu. Thank you very much for your contribution. We really value you. And uh, as a presidential candidate, we hope that one day you'll stand again. And if you win, you'll help us to propagate what we are saying. Thank you very much, King Kingwa. Uh, Chair, I want to say thank you very much together with the organizing committee, especially you, Dr. Gona and Dr. Mary Muyandi. We are very grateful because Chair, you have really uh, promoted the, the team spirit in the department. And it's because of that spirit that you have seen almost everybody, every member of the department play a different role. And uh, we are really very, very happy and very grateful to you, Chair together with Dr. Gona and Dr. Muyandi. Thank you very much. Margaret, I'll say thank you very much. I'm happy you have come. I would also like to thank our, our institution, the University of Nairobi, through its various organs, who have been able to provide us with the various facilities. Thank you very much. The Dean and other organs of the university, we say thank you very much. I would also like to say thank you very much to various sponsors. You have seen that we have had so many, uh, not only facilities, but we have had food, we have had, uh, we have had uh, for example, members of the church. Thank you very much, young people. I'm, I'm happy because you have also been able to learn something about history as Anteni Sana. Uh, last but not least is that we should not everything, take everything for granted. The success of this conference can be attributed to God. We should say thank you to God for allowing us to run this conference successfully we are very grateful. Thank you very much. Asante ni sana. Naomba ya kwamba mweze kubarikiwa wherever you go. Thank you very much. <laughs>